You see the full screen and the poll is also still up. Okay, we're broadcasting. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for joining. So we're going to wait a couple of minutes. So most of the attendees, uh, to give some time for most of the attendees to join. And uh, we'll start. Meanwhile, you can write us in the chat what's a new thing you're doing working from home like everyone. Okay, we'll wait one more minute and then we will start. Hope everybody's staying healthy and doing well. We have people from all around the world. As you can see in the chat, we New York, Austria, Turkey. Some good attendance from Turkey actually. Dublin, hello from Germany. Yeah, actually most of the team is broadcasting from Berlin. Uh, you're going to meet most of, most of them. And then Dr. Jan and Sune are doing that from, from Denmark. OK, I think to, to keep the schedule on, we're going we're gonna to get started. I hope everyone can, can hear me. Um, so thank you for joining us in this uh, special virtual seminar. Uh, the key word in here is virtual. Actually, we had planned together with Reshape a physical workshop in our offices at Formlabs in Berlin. But due to the situation, we, we shifted that paid uh, full day long workshop into this virtual seminar. And we compressed the content into three hours to try to share sh uh, three shapes and Formlabs knowledge into how to uh, produce clear aligners in-house, whether you're a, you're a lab or a practice. 
So uh, we're going to start going through the presentation. Our main speakers today uh, for this session will be uh, uh, Jacob, Sune, and Bernard. Uh, they will introduce themselves shortly in details. And uh, our supporting speakers who will be handling most of the questions and answers, uh, uh, answering most of your questions through the, the Q&A um, uh, part would be Dr. Elisa. Hi, Dr. Elisa. Hello, everyone. So Dr. Yes. Elisa is our clinical protocols and KOL manager at Formlabs. Thanks, Dr. Elisa. And uh, Dr. Jan is joining as well from, uh, from Three Shape. Hi, Dr. Jan. Hello from Copenhagen. <laughs> Amazing. And I'll be as well helping uh, uh, moderating this uh, virtual seminar and answering some of your questions. So uh, Jacob, would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Hi, my name is Jacob. I'm one of the senior members with the Formlabs EU team. Uh, it's quite funny. I've been with the company for a little bit over four and a half years now. Back then I was the seventh employee. Now we're around about 150 in our offices in Berlin. And yeah, currently I'm a pro services trainer. So I'm technically traveling all over Europe now, just digitally right like today. Uh, but I'm basically training all our customers and how to use these machines and how to get better at working with us. Amazing. Thank you, Jacob. Sune? Yes, hello. My name is uh, Sune Nago, and I'm living here in, uh, in Denmark. I'm a global training and application specialist for uh, 3SHIP, and I've uh, been working for 3SHIP for almost three years. I was educated as a dental technician, and I look forward to uh, taking you through uh, some, uh, some tips and tricks on how to, uh, how to scan, uh, do a good scan for, for clear liners. And then later, we will uh, look into the software, how you plan your treatment, and uh, provide the models that, uh, that uh, ESTL files that you should uh, use for, for 3D printing. Yeah, thank you, Sune. Bernard? Yeah, hi to everybody from Berlin. My name is Bernhard von Oppel. I'm a German master data technician with more than 20 years of professional experience and a strong interest in new technologies uh, in the dental business. So my first contact with 3D printing was about 10 years ago when I went to the IDS in Cologne. And at that time, I was really disappointed with the quality and uh, the hardware availability. And 10 years later, in my uh, former job, um, we bought a Form 2 printer and I was really impressed. And that's why I decided uh, that I wanted to advance this technology in the dental field and join Formlabs as a dental solution engineer. Thanks, Bernard. Amazing lab, by the way, in the background. <laughs> Uh, so some housekeeping rule before we start. So I, I can see that you already started using the chat. Uh, please uh, try not to use it in the future. If you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A. And then the background will be answering your question throughout the virtual seminar. Don't hesitate to ask any question you have. And uh, we'll be pushing some polls to understand a bit better the audience and tailor the message that we're delivering throughout this virtual seminar. So we urge you please to uh, answer these polls and fill them out when we push them through. So that's regarding the housekeeping. Uh, again, our what's what's like why we're here today and our main goal is to share our knowledge and with you guys on how to produce clear aligners in the practice or in your lab. So that will be the goal and hopefully by end of this, this virtual seminar you will get to know how to, the different steps on how to produce a clear aligner from intraoral scanning to actually setting up the teeth and planning the, the, the treatment into actually printing the models and then finally thermoforming them and delivering them. The agenda here is in more details. It's set to Berlin time basically. But in brief, first we'll do this welcome and overview of the aligner production workflow. And uh, then Sune will take us through inter interactive intraoral scanning session to acquire the, the intraoral scan and some tips and tricks for specific aligner cases and intraoral scanning. Then we'll go into our first break with uh, Dr. Elisa. Uh, the, Dr. Elisa will explain a bit more uh, how Formlabs is handling the COVID-19 response, the amazing projects we're working on, printing swabs, supporting the healthcare community system. And uh, finally, uh, after that break, we'll jump into the plan and designing of the different step for clear aligners. Sune will be sharing his screen and taking you through the clear aligner studio steps. And then uh, one of the most anticipated breaks will be joined by um, 
by a yoga teacher who, uh, who will be sharing a very relaxing 20 minutes yoga, yoga break with you. Uh, so prepare your mats, uh, make sure you're in comfortable uh, uh, clothes so you can enjoy the most and make the most out of this yoga session. After the break, we jump into the form labs part uh, where Jacob will take us through the software, super user friendly software from, from form labs called Preform and how you choose the right resin and material to print your thermoformed models, your models that you would thermoform the clear aligners on. And then uh, in general, Bernard will take the next step where he will take us through a deep dive into, the, into 3D printing in general and 3D printing with form labs, the different resins and how to finish thermoform and deliver the clear aligner. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask the questions throughout the session, uh, but at, at the end, we'll have like a bit of a 10 minute uh, a live answer to the questions. And if most probably you're on European time, you can share a beer with us and a happy hour. So uh, basically, so uh, let us tell you a bit more about uh, who we are as Formlabs and 3Shape. So uh, Formlabs now we're a bunch of around 700 people around the globe with seven office locations across the globe. So uh, we manufacture professional and affordable desktop 3D printers uh, that are aimed for different industries, whether it's engineering, healthcare, or specifically dentistry. This is actually our product line and history. In 2000, late 2011, we started with our Kickstarter campaign launching the Form 1. And now last year, 2019, we launched three major products, the Form 3, the Form 3L, and the Form 3D. The Form 3D will be our focus today. It's a 3D printer that is focused on the dental market for dental professionals. So uh, as a company, as people, we, we, we have a mission. Our mission is expanding access to digital fabrication uh, so anyone can make anything. So this applies to the different industries. Uh, you can see my special sweater uh, that I'm wearing. It actually has some of the sample parts uh, and parts that we print on our printers. And then you can see also on the screen. So uh, whether you're a dental technician, whether you're, 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 uh, you're a dentist, we wanna expand your access to digital fabrication through affordable and professional desktop 3D printing. So this is who is Formlabs. And, and then starting maybe in 2017 in IDS, we saw this huge hype uh, on our general purpose printer, the Form 2 back then. And then there was a clear sign uh, that we need to do, to do something specific for the dental industry. And hence in 2019, November 2019, we launched our dental specific brand and business unit, which is Formlabs Dental. And the natural thing to do under this business unit uh, and, and brand is to partner with workflow partners like 3Shape like we're doing today and ensure how to share the knowledge and, and the right training to be able to cover the whole workflow of digital dentistry. And this is where I give the word to Dr. Rian to tell you more a bit about the story of 3Shape. So welcome everybody. So 3Shape started now uh, over 20 years ago uh, by Nikolai and Thijs. Um, it's a global company with uh, offices in more than 21 countries, uh, production facilities in all uh, parts of the world, and of course, uh, customers also all over the world. Uh, if we look at the different products, um, we can see that the mission for 3Shape, if you change the slide, Giorgio, uh, is to actually change dentistry and change it together with the users. So whatever the users wanted or wanted a change in, 3Shape tried to reach and create a solution for that one. So specializing, specializing in uh, software and scanning hardware, uh, making it possible to do a, have a nice CAD CAM solution, both in the laboratory, but also in the clinic as well. So uh, we can see that it's uh, almost like the iPhone of uh, phones. Uh, so the scanner and 3Shape is working again here uh, also with applications. Uh, today we will be focusing on Clear Aligner Studio, the one in the middle of the bottom. Uh, but you see there are many more applications available. And this is what changes and is the difference between one scanner and the other. Uh, and with that, Georgia, I'll give the hand back to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. So basically, this is our aim today. We want to cover the different steps of, of, of uh, this workflow. 
And uh, before we start, I would like to suggest a poll for the attendees. So I will uh, relaunch a poll. And as stated, please, if you can uh, take a minute to, uh, to fill out that poll, answer these questions. We want to better understand the audience that just joined. We're around uh, 900 attendees now. Uh, so we want to understand a bit uh, where you come from, what is, uh, what is your adoption rate, what is your level of expertise. It would be great if you can answer the questions to that poll. And then straight afterwards, in a couple of seconds, uh, Sune will take over my screen and uh, we'll start with the first part, which is scanning for orthodontic cases. Okay, so we see a huge amount of participation. This is great. Oh, more people are writing in the chat. Hamburg, Spain, Seattle, from all around the world. Nice, good to have everyone here. Okay, Sune, I will try to give you um, control of my screen so you can Yeah, just a sec. Okay, so uh, I will end the poll now. So uh, yeah, we have some uh, very interesting uh, results. Uh, so you can see uh, that actually most of our participants have actually already uh, an intraoral scanner and a lot are actually super excited to, uh, to get one if they don't have. And uh, we have a, like a, almost, um, to third of lab uh, technicians who joined that actually uh, receive less than 50% intraoral scans. Okay, so not all of you are receiving that much of intraoral scan. Okay, and, uh, and okay, most of our participants, actually 50% of our participants have actually already a 3D printer. Amazing, okay. So I'm gonna switch the screen to Sune. So he can take us through his, uh, the steps of internet or scanning for clear aligner cases. Sune, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Giorgio. And, uh, and thank you for letting me join in this. It's nice to see that so many people are interested in uh, going digital. It's nice to see that so many uh, already have bought a, 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 a intraoral scanner and also uh, a 3D printers, because uh, as we can see uh, down the line, it's, it's, it's the way the, the future goes. And then um, I'm going to be talking about the, the first step of this workflow in order to get the uh, clear liners uh, that you can hand over to your patient, a real product that you can, uh, that you can share with, with, your, um, with your patients. The first thing in this workflow is, of course, uh, capturing the detail of, of the, the patient, getting the data from the, from the mouth. And to do that, we need, a, we need an, some sort of a scanner. Either we can do an... an uh, normal impression and then uh, cast it in stone and uh, and then you could bring it send it to your lab and the lab can do a, a scanning of this uh, with the lab scanner or you can choose to have an intro all scanner and capture the data right away and then use the facility of the internet to uh, to send this uh, really fast to a to a provider or, or lab or uh, or design center that, that can help you on on uh, creating these uh, aligner sets up uh, Georgia, is it okay if I if uh, I mute your microphone? It's just so that we don't hear two voices at the same time. Yeah, uh, good. I can see that in the chat. So scanning, what is scanning all about? Well, it is uh, the idea is to give a, a better experience for the patient. So when you come to a clinic, getting that impression material can be a little bit of a challenge, both for for you but also for the doctor, uh, because it is it can be a, a, a challenge. So the idea. Uh, Eventually, when we started uh, developing uh, intro hall scanner, was to uh, to improve the the whole uh, experience, both for the doctor but also for uh, especially for the patient. So, uh, scanning for clear aligners is not really that different from scanning from everything else, except that that you are going to capture a little bit more data. So, I'm going to look into uh, how you use the the scanner, and and uh, the scanner that, that we use is is uh, the Trier scanner, um, and I'm going to talk about what can be the obstacles or some of the, the difficult parts when you are scanning for, 
or case where the teeth is crowded, if they are overlaying each other, or if you have missing teeth, if the teeth are tilted, uh, if you have very large gaps between um, uh, teeth inside the mouth. And then, of course, also uh, at the end, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about orthodontics and, and look into this. So crowding, why is crowding, why can crowding uh, be a, a challenge uh, sometimes? Well, uh, if you see the image here, you can see the, the two incisors are actually lying on top of each other and they are sharing uh, bits of uh, data, uh, both of them, and uh, to capture the details in between them. You really need a good uh, interval scanner that is able to, um, um, to quickly uh, capture the data so that you can maneuver uh, the scanner around in the mouth without uh, being too stressed. The scanner shouldn't be stopping uh, while it's scanning uh, and and the scanner should, should capture the, the, the fine details uh, so that you can send it for, for production uh, with high level uh, products there. Capturing things in between um, uh, approximal areas or where teeth are very close to cr uh, crowding, you need to have an uh, oral scanner that, is, uh, uh, that has more capability than just scanning the surface. So the TRIUS has some, um, some zoom functions that you can use to zoom in to the actual areas that are causing issues, and then uh, it will scan more details in, in, this, in these parts. Here we see a, a color scan. The TRIUS is also able not just to scan the surface, but actually also to apply um, uh, colors to it. And the latest thing that we uh, introduced to the, to the TRIUS for is, is the caries detection aid, which is also uh, applied onto the, the scan. So, you can follow and see a, a progression of, of, um, of a treatment that is, uh, that is ongoing. Normally, when, when, when we are scanning for crowns, um, small bridges or implants, we usually only scan a, a quadrant. But uh, scanning for aligners, we need to scan the full mouth. We need to scan the full upper and the full lower. We also need to have a, a bite, bite registration for both sides. And, um, that, that can cause some issues. Uh, some patient has very, uh, very deep uh, palate. Um, uh, and here again, uh, it's, it's important that, that you get familiar with the use of uh, turning on and on, turning on and off the, uh, the AI scanning, for instance, but also uh, turning uh, on and off the zoom functions. Because if you have something that lies really deep, then uh, the zoom function is your, is your help in need uh, when there are issues here. So tilted teeth, tilted teeth where you also have gaps uh, can also be an issue because the, the, the scanner is actually um, building a, uh, upon a picture. So the first picture that the scanner takes inside the mouth is uh, usually uh, the occlusal surface of the, the big molar. And from that picture, it stitches on uh, and building up the whole scan. Um, the good thing about that is that when we do that, then we can control the stitching and we can close the holes if there are any holes that are appearing uh, during the scan. But we do get some challenges um, once we get to the large gaps. And that's because um, this, the scanner can only scan what it can see. So if there's suddenly a long distance uh, from the occlusal surface that we see up here down to the, um, uh, the palate, then we need to find a different path and then build the soft tissue also before we continue building the teeth. So some of the tips there is to, uh, to think about uh, the path. It's a bit like the same way when, when you have a phone and you want to uh, do a panoramic image, then uh, you have a beautiful view that you want to capture. Then if you think about the, the line or the, um, the path that you want to capture before you start doing it, then there's a bigger chance that you get a beautiful image. And it's exactly the same with the scanner. Think about the path that you need to uh, go in order to uh, capture all the details of, uh, of the patient. So large gaps can be especially for missing teeth, um, for implants and so on. And here again, it's important that you think about uh, the areas that the uh, scanner is able to capture very easily so that you can go back and continue from there. And then you build from, uh, from a certain point and then onwards. So getting a good scan is all about having a good scan strategy. And that's what I'm going to take you through uh, in the next um, uh, couple of things. Because when we go into orthodontics and uh, a clear liner uh, treatment, we need to have a little bit more detail than just a, a tooth 
or crown. We need to have some uh, some gingiva, uh, the soft tissue that is uh, above and, and uh, behind the teeth. And we need to have at least between uh, three, sometimes four millimeters in order to be able to, to make a good uh, clear line of production. So um, obviously we see here that we need a, a scanner both up and lower and that's what we are, we are gonna uh, uh, see through this uh, little presentation here. So um, what we're gonna see is that um, we are scanning the upper and then uh, the lower. And after that, we need two uh, byte registrations. So we need a byte registration of uh, left and right side uh, in order to uh, bring the two scans together in the patient's bite. So here's an example of a, a liner case. And you can see uh, once you stop the scanning, uh, if you notice that there are holes in the scan, you have to go back and, uh, and stitch those holes together uh, by scanning the surface one more time. If you see double stitching like here, then it's also uh, issues that can cause uh, problems, especially when, when the, the 3D printer uh, receives it. It's important to capture the full mouth. So uh, the more detail, the better, especially in, in the back of the, of the big molars, the uh, seven and, and the eight. So the scan strategy starts in the occlusal surface. That's the, uh, the surface of the, the big molar teeth, uh, the, our bite. Then we move uh, onto the uh, to the front where we do we call it the wiggle. That's where we uh, we take the scanner and then we uh, we wiggle it a little bit up and down to capture uh, the fine details in the incisal edge. And then um, we continue the scan. The first thing that is important is that you scan the full upper jaw uh, jaw from uh, one side to the other, and then you start building down uh, the size. So you can see here when the scanner starts, there are some areas that are white. Uh, in the small uh, image uh, down to the right, you can see uh, the shadow that the, the scanner is, is reflecting onto the, the patient's mouth. And uh, those are the areas that the, the scanner cannot see. So we need to get, uh, go back and then capture the details here. But the first thing that is important is that we capture the full uh, jaw from side to side, because then we can build from that. So now we are scanning on the uh, limbal side, that's on the inside of the teeth. We do that uh, first uh, after we've done uh, an occlusal scan, and that's because the tongue is in the way. The tongue has a, yeah, it's a strong muscle, and it uh, it has a tendency to want to push the scanner away. So uh, that's why you always scan the lingual side first, and then you go up to the uh, to the outer side of the teeth. For those that are not in uh, in dental terms, it's uh, it's, it's the, the buccal side or the facial side of the teeth. And then we scan the upper, and the process is more or less the same. We start. Uh, at the top of the big molar uh, to capture a lot of the detailed uh, data here, because if the scanner stops, then we can always go back and continue from there. We get to the front, and here again, you see uh, a little bit of wiggling, um, and you should think of it as, a, as, as quite a lot. Uh, actually, it's uh, when you have the scanner in here, the mirror is pointing in a, in a uh, certain angle so you need to do a, a wiggle where you put the scanner actually quite high and also quite low so if you if you start in the back and you aim for the tip of the nose and then you do the wiggling and then you go to the back then you usually you will uh, have scanned a really good arch um, that is um, uh, a good reference for for the rest of the scan in the upper uh, we do the outside first and then we go into the inside and uh, here you can see that we scan the palette this palette is not that deep, so the scanner is actually able to, uh, to receive the areas. And once we've done the full scan, we can see that there are a few areas that are still needing uh, some more details. You can go back and then fill out the holes um, that is required. Um, if the holes are small enough, the software is actually able to close the holes uh, accordingly. And then we uh, move on to the, uh, to the byte, byte registration or the occlusion. It's simply done by putting the scanner into the mouth, asking the patient to bite together, and then scan uh, some of the areas that we already did. So we start by scanning the molars, we move it a little bit back, and then you continue until the, um, the canine uh, uh, in, the, in the front. And then the software will uh, align the two scans, upper and lower together. And, uh, and these ones you then send out to your, your provider clear liner provider or your lab, or you, or, or you continue with the, with the software um, 
that you have on your working station. So this is the process that we, uh, we've been going through. And uh, you saw the workflow bar up at the top. And that's, uh, yeah, you can see it here. So those are the steps that uh, is required to do uh, on the scanner uh, to get a good scan. Yeah, so uh, some of the details that um, I just want to add is that at the back of the teeth, there might be um, some intersections because the, the, the jaw, uh, upper and lower jaw, if you capture a lot of details back there, then it's a good idea to go and trim these areas. And you can do that with the scanner also. There's a trimming tool, like a scissor, where you simply uh, click the tool and then you paint onto the scan and you say remove, and then it uh, cuts away the details that are intersecting each other. All right, so uh, that was it about the, the scanning process. I think I'm going to switch to the next slide. Maybe I will hand it over to you again, uh, Georgia. Yes, uh, yeah. thanks. thanks, Rene. Uh, so uh, just before we jump into that, uh, that part, uh, I think we have maybe a couple of, of questions to, to that part. So before we go into the coffee break, so uh, like, uh, for example, when do you know if you need to rescan the hole or it's enough for an orthodontics case? Um, the, when, once you're done uh, scanning and, uh, and you let this, the scanner just uh, process uh, the data, then it will show with the colors if uh, the holes are okay um, to continue. If, if you see an, uh, an open hole in the, in the scan, then it means that the, the software does not have sufficient enough data to close the hole. And then you need to, to go back and, uh, and, and do an, an extra scanning of it. So here, just on, on top of the, the central incisor, you can see that there's actually a small hole uh, at the edge of the software that uh, has not been filled out. And uh, a hole like that, if you want to have the, the, the detail, then you simply just put the scanner back in. It locates the place and then it fills out the data. Okay. Um, and like maybe a question to Bernard and and uh, Jacob in this case. Um, I know from like form labs um, that that we've been we see a lot of support cases and services cases related to some uh, uh, misprints that are originally caused by uh, in, in not a well done intraoral scan. Are there like any any tips or guidelines that you would li like to add on top of what uh, Sune just explained to the audience? Sure. Um, basically, the one big tip I have is practice a bit if you have maybe a model that like don't take a patient and be like, hey, can you sit still for two hours? I want to practice a little bit. Maybe do that on a model. But um, take your time with the scanner um, and don't just do one very quick and rough pass. Um, of course, that can give you quite usable results. Uh, typically, what I tend to say with all kinds of software, and that's true for the three-shape scanning software, as well as our preform software, which I'm going to show you later, basically every minute that you take for a little bit of a nicer preparation can multiply itself into the post-processing that you will have to do. So skimping out on the scanning process and not doing it properly, uh, leaving a lot of holes in will give you an, a result that has way higher tolerances than what you want to have in the end. And it will also give you much more in difficulties in terms of post-processing and fixing those holes that you left in. So take your time, practice it a little bit, and then you very quickly get the hang of it. I, I, I would like to add that uh, one of the most um, important thing of uh, intraoral scan if you want to make a model is that you need to have a smooth margin line of the skin. If your margin line is very feathered, this will lead to a model uh, with really small parts that that are not are really printable and that will uh, lead to failed prints. Yeah, so th that's mainly for the restorative cases. I know that uh, some of our audiences actually are uh, GPs yeah. and uh, postodontists. So, so yeah, uh, Dr. Elisa, if you have anything to add. Yes, that. thank you, Georgia. Actually, what I want to add is that the principles of a good impression and getting a good model are the same both for analog and the digital workflow. So it's a matter of following the instructions, just like Sune said, uh, in order to achieve a good scan. And actually, it's very good uh, that we're pointing this out because not having a good scan would also translate into a bad print, potentially. 
So it's very important to follow this protocol and see that we're uh, registering correctly all the tooth surfaces and, uh, and having a, a very nice image in order for have them uh, uh, translated this into a good model. So it's a matter, as Jacob said, of doing some skill training, maybe with a model first in order to get the technique right. Uh, and then uh, the next step will be go to a patient. It's very easy to use. I mean, I have tried the, the scanner itself and it's very intuitive and, and manageable. It's just uh, once you get it right, I know that it's very easy to, to register a patient's anatomy. So practice and also uh, be, uh, uh, have your eyes upon having a good scan so you have the rest of the workload done right. Yeah. I get the, there are some questions in the Q&A like, uh, can you scan the patient with an open mouth and uh, uh, can you do sensory uh, relation and so on? Uh, do you need to scan the palate for, for clear liners? Uh, no, you don't need to, to scan the whole uh, palate, but of course you need to have um, sufficient enough data on, on the back of the teeth. Uh, yes, you are able to scan an, an, uh, an open mouth. The scanner will simply scan whatever it sees. So if the patient is biting into a, a, a wax rim or, or a, a gorge of some, some sort that keeps the teeth uh, in an open position or protruded position, then when you put the scanner in and, and you register that as the bite, then the software will align the teeth uh, with an open bite. So that is definitely possible also. Um, I don't think you would do that for a clear liner because you are interested in having the occlusion, but for other treatment, yes, um, it's definitely possible with this scanner. Um, there's also a question, can, can you send the scan to a patient? Yes. Um, that's a nice feature that, that uh, is in the software because uh, uh, if you have the triage, you will register for something that's called a, a communicate account where you uh, can send the scan to the cloud and then from the cloud uh, labs can pick it up uh, or uh, other software providers uh, can, can receive the scan from there. And if you just get the, um, the patient's email at the end, you can type in the patient's email, it says send to patient, and then uh, the patient will, will receive a, a small app on their, uh, on their mobile phone, a little instruction on how to download the app. It's a, it's a simple small viewing app, and then they can uh, get the picture. So they can view them themselves, and they can use that for, for communication also uh, with their friends and, and colleagues and so on. So, so that's also possible. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jan, any special questions that you've been answering that uh, are worth sharing with uh, the rest of the audience online before we jump into our COVID response? Uh, I looked at some questions about uh, the scanner, how it picks up if your scan is bad and so on. And there is a, a color um, feedback when you're scanning, uh, if you need to scan more uh, in a certain area, for example. Uh, also, there's an automatic hole close, uh, which closes the area. And if you don't need it for anything else, you can leave that be. The software will close the hole. But if it's in an area where you actually need the information, like on an incisal edge for the aligners or uh, in a rotating a tooth, then of course you should observe that and go back and scan again. And the, the fantastic thing with the intraoral scanner is that you can scan first and then you can see where you have to go back and then automatically just fill out that place and the scan is uh, perfect again. So it's very easy to go back and uh, fix areas uh, which you have missed. Um, also, I guess there are some concerns from our audience who don't, uh, who like not everyone has uh, already owns an intraoral scanner and not all the lab technicians from the audience actually receive only intraoral scanners. So uh, what we're discussing today about the clear aligner workflow, is, is this possible with uh, starting with a conventional impression? Yes, you can. So what you can do is that you take your conventional impression, send it to your laboratory, and they will scan it in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. So uh, almost all labs today have, a uh, let's say, a digital scanner, uh, which uh, creates a 3D model inside the computer. And in there, they will have the same software uh, that uh, soon as we'll show now after the break. Uh, and they can actually create the uh, setups for the aligners and create models and uh, thermoform there as well. So even if you don't have an uh, intro scanner, you can start uh, working with clear aligners already today. Great. Amazing. Um, 
If there are no uh, other questions, I think uh, Dr. Issa, the, the floor is yours for um, to share the screen and go into the COVID coffee break part. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. That is uh, in Europe and, and Eastern side. And good morning to those in the US and Latin America. That now it's your time to go and grab a coffee. So we deep dive into the next sector about Clear Niner Studio together with Sunit. So now it's your moment. So if you want to take a break. And for those who are staying, uh, one of the things that, as, as Giorgio mentioned that we wanted to, to show uh, was a little bit about the Formlabs response to the COVID-19 uh, uh, current situation. So it's just a brainstorm and showcasing some of the, of the things that we are working on. So uh, it's, uh, let me check it there. So it's just a walkthrough. So if you want more information and you're interested in learning about the projects a little more in deep dive, you can go to our website. I left the link here in the slide. Uh, where you can learn about the different things that we're working on. So a little bit about what we're, we're, we're doing today. So we know that we are all in this situation. We're working from home, uh, practices are closed, and we know that everyone is in this, uh, we're in on this together. And there are a lot of initiatives that are happen happening today. And we want to thank our community because we have a form up on our website where if you need help or you want to provide help uh, on the different projects that we're working on, you can uh, fill out that form in order to, to collaborate. And now we have more than 2,300 people already uh, offering or reaching out to us for this kind of project. So we want to thank for that collaboration and also for the patients because we are also trying to uh, follow the, the clinical protocols and uh, getting in touch with the specific regulatory agencies in order to respect what is a, a, the, the corresponding workflows for these applications. So a little bit about what we are doing. So today uh, we have like two routes where people are engaging themselves or collaborating that can be uh, clinical, uh, clinical projects or non-clinical projects. So for clinical projects, of course, this will be consisting of uh, the printing of nasal swaps uh, or, or, or accessories for the ventilators or uh, protective personal equipment, adapting what we will see snorkel masks for this purpose. So it's more, um, let's say, de uh, devices that are used in hospital context for the doctors and nurses that are uh, in the front line uh, dealing with the pandemic today. So that's one of the routes that we're working on. And then the other route is the non-clinical uh, application. So we have a lot of the community which are not involved maybe in medical device production or have a form lab printer for other purposes and still want to help out. So we managed to uh, curate and put up this community part library that actually it's, uh, it's very interesting because you can see some specific uh, companies or projects that have been developing, uh, as we will see, uh, door handles that you can print that uh, using your, your printer. So a little bit about the clinical projects. This has been one of the biggest initiatives that uh, we have been working on, uh, it's a US uh, initiative overall. So together with USF Health and Northwell Health, uh, Formlabs has collaborating, uh, the, the team of professionals of USF and Northwell have developed a design for an isofatal swap. They're used for the COVID-19 testing. And uh, we have been, uh, they are using Formlabs solutions for this. And currently in our Ohio facility, uh, ISO registra registrated facility. Uh, Formlabs today is printing swaps for US-based institutions. And actually this, is, um, uh, this came up due to the current situation. And it was uh, very interesting because we just see that 3D printing, of course, in dentistry, we're using it for dental applications, but we know that it has a lot of potential to help on other verticals. So healthcare actually is been, it's having a, a huge benefit from this today. And this is a very nice opportunity to see uh, how in creative hands and the professional hands, some incredible things can, can come out. So other type of projects also related to the clinical route are, for example, conversion kits. This is a project from Spain. So uh, as you will see here, this is um, this good team of professionals uh, adapted a scuba mask uh, by 3D printing adapters that allowed them to convert this into a personal protective equipment. And this had been developed by this team of professionals and a lot of hospitals from Spain are involved in this project. 
And um, as you can see in the pictures, and they, they, they has already been used in the hospital context. And they also have a fundraising, uh, the, the 3D Digital Factory that's leading this initiative in GoFundMe. So if you also want to, to collaborate with this project, I also left the link there. Uh, but it's, a, it's one of also an example of the creative people behind this and how they managed to adapt maybe a conventional snorkel mask into something that actually it's very useful for, for the healthcare community. So another project just like the swaps, but this is done in Spain. This is a press release from the Gobierno de Cantabria. Uh, as you can see, uh, Hospital Virtual Valdesilla, they have developed their own design of nasal swaps. And as you see, they're using also form of solution for this uh, situation. And actually this is very interesting Again, they're using a biocompatible and uh, resin and also that can be autoclave. And uh, it's, uh, it's curious to see that due to the current shortage of nasophasal swaps in, uh, in a lot of countries, we also, the, the 3D printing allows even like in remote areas or that are not in the US or Europe still to be using 3D printing for this kind of situations. So uh, now going back to the roots, now with the non-clinical one, uh, you can also go to our website and uh, to the community part library and you will see here like face mask fitters, bias tape maker, uh, door handles, face mask clips that you can use. So if you're currently using 3D printing for um, uh, dental applications and you want to print something that it's more not, not for clinical use, let's say, there, there are some creative ideas here that you can use um, your printer for and I invite you and you can both collaborate if you already have a design or also uh, download and redirect to the companies for these SPL files. So now coming back to dental, because one of the things that also uh, in interesting of dentistry and how this can benefit from 3D printing is that the other day, one of our, uh, one of our super users, uh, KOL's uh, Dr. Burton from the US, uh, shared this testimonial with us and I thought it was worth sharing is that uh, they, he had a case of a patient losing his retainers. And the thing is that uh, now with the shut, current shutdown and with a practice close, it's very hard for us to see patients. And sometimes th things can happen, of course, or maybe seeing on an emergency basis. And today, um, with this testimony, what I want to share with you is that this patient uh, lost his retainers. And the, the, this doctor already had the intraoral scan of the patient. He already had designed the, he had the model and, and designed the, 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 let's say, thermoform the retainer, but it was lost. Uh, they man the dental assistant of this doctor managed to go to the practice, uh, print the model and thermoform the, the final retainer and mailed it to the, to the patient. And actually this was a, it is very good because it, uh, it allows us to see that you can delegate a lot of the steps of the workflow to their dental staff without having to be two people in order to do this. So uh, it's, it's a very good opportunity to see 3D printing and the digital workflow overall with other eyes in the current situation that we're living in. So you can use this as a very powerful resource and maybe treat, uh, treat some specific cases remotely which is something that maybe with a conventional workflow we weren't able to see before. So uh, this is just a, a call to action that maybe this uh, current situation allows us to think with more creative minds. And yeah, so that's what I wanted to share and uh, hope that you enjoy the rest of the, work, the seminar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elisa. Uh, I think this, this last slide summarizes a bit um, the versatility of, of having a, a desktop and user-friendly 3D printer. Uh, actually, in different industries, not specifically in dental now, um, we have a lot of engineers who work on prototyping that are just packing their three desktop 3D printer from the office and taking it back to, to their home so they don't stop their productivity and continue on doing this. And this brings me to a very interesting point where is like now working from home uh, viewing that pandemic is most probably a very good opportunity to learn new skills including maybe how to um, 3D print, how to be more, uh, how to master 3D printing. Especially that with a desktop 3D printer, you can have it at home, you can practice with the software. I think Jacob will mention that later, Freeform software is free to download. So you can just download it and, 
and play with it, import some scans, see how user friendly it is, see what costs you to print one model, and 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 get uh, get to know it a bit more. So, thank you very much for that. Um, so we still have a couple of minutes uh, for the break, actually a minute and a half. Um, I would suggest while anyone has anything to add, uh, I will send you a poll. Uh, trying to understand better who from the audience is currently producing clear aligners and like, and if not, uh, what are like your, uh, your major concerns for not doing so. Uh, so for the second, if you cannot skip the second question, um, uh, just uh, choose uh, one of the major concerns you had before going into in-house clear aligner production. So I'm gonna send the poll right now. So we'll take like a minute before we start again and then the floor will be to actually um, Sune. Uh, so if you can jump one slide. Please. Yeah, of course. Uh, would be like the plan and design steps for clear aligners. Uh, and this is basically the next step and the next slide. Uh, which is the planning and designing. So we give you one more minute, grab your coffee before we get into a dense uh, clear aligner studio session with Sune and uh, please answer the poll meanwhile. So we're surprisingly perfectly on time so far. Uh, this is good news for everyone. Yeah. Let's, this, let's just wait for the poll a few seconds. I can see yeah, people are yeah. still uh, handling, and then I'll take over the screen. Just but, the uh, this whole thing was very interesting, trying to switch from this uh, physical workshop into, into a three-hour virtual seminar, keeping everyone engaged. Uh, I, I personally am very curious to see how the yoga session uh, will go and what will be the feedback on that. Uh, which is actually very good because uh, one of the, this is just sharing because one of the things that we also discuss is that we dentists, you know, we have a lot of on the upper side of our back with a lot of pain and in the neck. So this yoga exercises will be great for, for allowing yeah. us to stretch some parts that usually are a lot tense with our work modality. Yeah, I've heard that Adela or uh, the yoga teacher has tailored some uh, specific uh, uh, sequences for people who actually work the whole day as dentists and lab technicians bent over a patient or a ben, uh, lab bench. Um, so we have very interesting results. I'm going to end the poll and share it with you. So uh, here, if I share the results with you, we, we can see that uh, oh, 32% of our audience is actually currently producing clear aligners in the practice or lab. That's it's very surprising and, and very nice. And uh, a majority of the ones who are not doing yet are considering it. So, okay, I hope we increase the knowledge. We answer your, all your questions and concerns so you can jump into this interesting um, uh, indication that you can uh, do in-house, provide faster turnaround on clear aligner cases and reduce your cost actually to producers versus outsourcing them. Uh, like regarding the major concerns, I think this is a very good introduction for you, Sune. The major concern is actually planning and designing. So you have a hard work and hard job now to to make it uh, simple to everyone to convince them to switching to clear aligners. <laughs> okay, no pressure. Thank you very much, Sune. The floor is That's ready. good. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, I'm gonna take you through uh, uh, some of the, the the workflow or the steps. To, uh, that, that the software uh, provides. 3Shape has uh, an, an author system of, of different things that uh, an orthodontist can use, and uh, also uh, a regular dentist can also use uh, some of our, at least our apps. We have the treatment simulator that is uh, definitely used by a lot um, as a communication tool where you have the patient in the chair and you can communicate uh, the options, the possibilities, and also the things that are not possible to do. So this software is, is really uh, helpful uh, and it is on the scanner. So it's just a simple click of the button, you, you click next and then the teeth will be segmented and it will come comes with a, a suggestion that you can talk about and you can fine tune that also. We have the patient monitoring also where you can follow it, the treatment. So if you scan the patient uh, every time they're in the chair, you will be able to see 
uh, the, the detailing of, of the teeth that are moving and so on. And then we also have the author analyzer software here. This has a uh, planning tools and you have uh, the possibilities to add brackets uh, to your treatment. So if you uh, use uh, brackets uh, in, in your daily uh, practice, then you can, um, you can virtually place brackets on the teeth and see the result right away. And then you can uh, export that uh, into uh, a transfer tray where you can uh, easily do indirect bonding uh, on your patient. And then of course there's the uh, clear liner uh, workflows that is uh, also available. So once you open the software, this is uh, what is presented for you. Uh, it's, it's a patient browser or the patient uh, management system where you have all your cases. You can receive them directly from the triers or you can use the communicate um, account if you sign up for that. It's free, so, uh, so do that. Then you can uh, locate your patient and here we have a clear liner demo where, where you uh, can see the scan uh, as it comes. Uh, before starting uh, to, to moving the teeth, you have to prepare uh, the mesh surface because this is uh, the mesh is, uh, is the triangles that, uh, that are creating the 3D uh, surface and then there's color applied to that. But the scanner and the software does not really know that uh, some of the parts of the scan is teeth and other parts is soft uh, tissue. You have to, uh, you have to do a little work in order to get it uh, to understand uh, completely. Uh, so you need to segment the teeth uh, into uh, individual 3D objects that you can then move around into your in, in, into your treatment. So um, you can you can segment the teeth here. I have a scan with segmented teeth, and um, and then you can also prepare the full scan by putting a base onto the uh, onto the scan. We call it in 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 our world, and I think it's the same in four labs. We make the, the object watertight so that there are no holes whatsoever. Uh, that means that it's a, it's a solid 3D object that you can then uh, send to a, a manufacturing device of some kind. It could be a milling machine or, or a 3D printer. And then it'll use the coordinate to, to print the physical object. All right, so once you load the software into the, um, or the, the, the scan of the model in, into the software, it, uh, it looks like this. You can uh, turn it around and see from different sides. You have some visualization uh, uh, options with the software. You have some additional uh, tools that you can uh, add um, when you're doing your planning and, and your analysis. Uh, you can import a, a CBCT scan also, so you can see the whole bone structure and the roots and so on. So uh, super nice uh, features that, uh, that the software will, uh, will help, help to aid you and guide you in, in planning the treatment right. You can also change, work a little bit with the uh, occlusion. I saw some questions from the Q&A. Uh, how do I get a better bite? And uh, sometimes the bite is, is uh, different from what it looks like in, uh, in the patient. And uh, the software, if, if you're not able to correct it in the trees, then the, the author software can help you to, uh, to work with the occlusion either by working uh, with the direct model or by using the, uh, the virtual articulator. Like, that's also a place where you can manipulate the actual bite. Then we have some analysis tools. I'm not gonna go into those today because this is mainly focusing on, on the clear liner uh, productions uh, side with the, with the format with the 3D printing of models. So here we have the, the treatment options, the virtual setup, where you can create any kind of setup to see uh, what kind of space do I have if I extract a couple of teeth or if I expand the, the jaw and so on. And then uh, you can uh, ana do an analysis and see what would be uh, the best option for the patient. Bracket placement is a module by itself, so I will not cover this in, in this webinar, but uh, please go to, uh, to our learning hub there. You can also find the uh, webinars uh, regarding these, uh, these topics. So let's dig into the, the clear liner uh, workflow that uh, the 3Shape software offers. The first thing that hits you is a disclaimer. <laughs> And it's not by chance, it's, uh, it's really because going into uh, the digital world, anything is possible. We have added some limitations so that you cannot go completely bananas, but uh, uh, you have to uh, take some responsibilities on, on how you, uh, you treat your patients. Um, because we are dealing with, uh, with real, uh, real scenarios and, and real cases here. So, uh, so think about that, you have to accept that because uh, we cannot take responsibilities of what you do with this software. There's, there's actually not that many um, uh, restrictions on it. So here, um, 
this is uh, how the, the user interface looks like. We can see uh, at the top, uh, we have a, a fixed workflow uh, uh, bar or a fixed workflow steps, uh, which we recognize from the, the TRIUS uh, scanning machine, where you can go uh, next, next, next through this workflow. So it, it guides you through the steps that is required. Uh, and that will be creating occlusal planes, segmenting the teeth. First you segment the upper and then you segment the lower. I can show you what it looks like because it's already been done. We're not going to spend time on it, but basically it is just putting two points on each side of the, of the teeth, defining the exact width of the teeth. And you also define uh, the uh, X or the long axis line as we call it for the tooth. And then the software will cut out uh, each tooth and turn them into individual objects. So now you can actually remove the soft tissue or you can also remove the, the teeth and look at the model like, uh, like this. So it consists of four steps. You, you go through all the steps and then you click next, next. And then uh, finally you get into this, uh, the virtual setup. And at the end, you can print the report. So let's uh, create a setup. Uh, we click this uh, green plus here um, to add a setup and we can create as many uh, scenarios, as many setup as we like. Uh, for this demonstration purpose, I will, I will go for a, a goal or a, let's say an ideal smile. The, we could call it um, final set, uh, final smile. So the final smile is uh, is our goal. That's that's where we want to head with this patient. And as soon as I create a setup, these constraint is applied. So we do have some small uh, teeth movement constraints that are um, uh, applied uh, so that um, you're, you are limited a little bit in the beginning on how you move the teeth. You can, however, turn it off if you want total freedom, but then you need to uh, really pay attention on, uh, on what you're doing. So the software gives you a lot of different tools that you, uh, you can work with. You can work with extraction. You can work with the uh, interapproximal reduction, uh, IPR. And you can also add attachments uh, to the software. So let me show you uh, some of the, the ways that you can, uh, you can move teeth. Uh, we have a scenario here with an upper and lower. Uh, we have a canine that is a little bit off. And um, yeah, I'm not going to go into the uh, discussion about the actual orthodontic treatment because I'm a dental technician uh, and I have been working with uh, in the orthodontic uh, segment for many years. But I would not say that I'm uh, classified or skilled enough to, uh, to actually perform an, uh, an orthodontic treatment. But uh, for demonstration purposes, I think you will get an idea about uh, what it is that we are talking about here. So I can uh, select the teeth because they have been segmented. When you select a tooth, it uh, turns blue. And uh, if you double click on the teeth, then you get some uh, control points. And these control points can help you to move the teeth. So uh, yeah, I can. Uh, move the teeth around. And then you can see that if I exceed uh, the limit that I in the software, then the constraint will be applied. So even though I try to move it more than that, I cannot uh, uh, because it's, it's, it's an active uh, limitation that is here. You can turn off the active limitations, then you will get the visual warning. Um, now you are exceeding the, the limits, so, um, but you can continue from there. That's also an option that you have with the software. If you rotate the model in a different view, then you will get different control points. So now I can move the teeth in and out and uh, uh, up and down. Uh, so depending on the view, you get different control points if you use the mouse. You can also just uh, simply grab a tooth uh, with the mouse and then uh, move it uh, around like this. So uh, it looks a bit crazy. The soft tissue will try to follow. Um, and that's if you want to do like a, a really fast uh, setup just to see, okay, how does this look? Mm, maybe that's, that's my goal. And then you want to go back and then go step by step uh, to, to see how can you reach that goal. So that is using the mouse. The other option is that you can also actually just use the keyboard. So you can select a tooth. And if you click uh, control on your keyboard, then you can, uh, with the arrow keys, you can move the teeth around uh, simply by clicking here. It goes in a translation step of uh, 0.10. You can turn it up and down if you want uh, faster movement or small, nice, detailed movements. And you can see here in the uh, overview of the teeth movement, 
you can actually also just type in an exact value. Uh, so if I want to have a rotation of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 1.578 uh, degrees, then when I hit enter, the tooth will uh, rotate according to that. So you can get full control this way. So either by using the keyboard or using the mouse. So let's see if we can uh, we can turn this patient into something a little bit more uh, uh, appealing. Uh, I think I will go for trying to just here in the beginning uh, aligning the uh, the incisal edges uh, of the mouth. We might need to do a little bit of expansion of the uh, of the teeth here in order to uh, correct the front. Uh, the way that I approach it now is that uh, I'm actually not really thinking about if I'm uh, creating collisions or uh, if the movement is not um, uh, done in the right sequence because for this um, this way of doing it, I'm uh, I'm simply just aiming for the final smile, um, and then I work my way backwards from from there. So if I create a little bit more space here. Small tooth movements like that. Then we can create a scenario that looks a little bit, uh, a little bit more straight teeth. Now we should have some space for this canine to get in here. Yeah, I know it might not be. Uh, maybe we are exaggerating uh, too much, and uh, this would not be possible to. Uh, to facilitate uh, in, in a real treatment. It, it's just so that you get, get an idea about how you move the teeth around. If we take a front view, then we uh, have some um, additional tools that can uh, help us to create a symmetry for the patient. So we have these uh, symmetry lines that we can activate, and then you can move them around to see if, uh, let's say I want to have my canine uh, in the same level, uh, then I can use this line as an, uh, as an aid or a guide uh, just to just to make sure that, that the teeth are aligned uh, the same way to each other. So just go like this. Let's tip this tooth a little bit. So here we go. Other additional tools that we have is that uh, we can mirror a tooth, meaning that if I, um, if I select a tooth, then I can see it mirrored on the other side. And that can also help me to really, you know, fine tune the detail on uh, is it exactly on the same position and that helps me to create the uh, symmetry uh, for, for the case. So you could do something like that. And you can also activate the original position and compare it with the, uh, with the new one. So um, when you do your planning and your treatment, you do have a lot of options to see uh, uh, before and after. So let's say that this is, a, this is the smile that we are aiming for. We agreed with the patient that we we have aligned the, the teeth and, and the R shape and we brought the canine in. Let's try and have a look at how the software can actually help us uh, in order to create the clear liners or the model for, for 3D printing. We do have a teeth movement overview that you can bring in. This is a full uh, table of uh, all the movement that has uh, been going on. Uh, we only did movements in the upper. So we can see uh, the different degrees, inclination, angulation, rotation, and so on. And then we can see the millimeters transferred it into uh, left and right, forward, backwards, and uh, yeah, up and down, intrusion and uh, extrusion. So if we bring this into the software, the software can help us to, to do the right calculation of how many aligners would actually be um, needed in order to facilitate this smile or these movements. So there's a button here that we can click on, and I can choose myself as a profession to uh, take complete control and say, well, I want to do this uh, treatment in uh, only nine aligners. So I simply just type in the value and then the software will generate nine aligner uh, models. I don't know if, uh, if, if, if that would be a good idea. Here it says the maximum translation step will be 0 0.17 uh, and the rotation, I mean, the degree will be uh, 1.67. Yeah. So, Nine aligners would probably not uh, work well, but I mean, as a profession and as a doctor, you know the patient, you know the situation, you, you know um, the physical analogy of, of the patient. Is it a young patient? Is it an adult? Is it, is it a, um, a healthy patient that has no uh, gum uh, issues, um, no gum disease and, and so on? So no patients are alike 
and you have to look at them individually in order to uh, you know uh, choose the best treatment a rule of thumb is that well most doctors agree that it is possible to move a tooth at least one millimeter in a period of almost a month without completely uh, uh, making uh, uh, any destruction of of uh, the situation of the root and so on remember it's individual for each patient but if you if you do a little calculation on that then you end up on uh, on something that looks like 0.25 uh, millimeter um, per each step so you can type the movement in here and then the software will tell you okay if you want to facilitate that then you need 13 aligners you cannot do it in line so the last option that we have is that in the author control panel you can set up a table for each individual tooth meaning that maybe your canine will not move as fast as your incisors or maybe the molar you don't want the molar to move at all then you can set that to zero um, or the premolars maybe uh, one of them can move faster than another um, one of them is uh, is easier to uh, to rotate than another so you get a full control in the control panel of each individual teeth and once you have that uh, we created an example in the software that's called the Paraliner Constraint Example. Um, if you activate that one, then the software will do a complete calculation on all of the teeth at the same time. And based on that, it tells me that I can actually finish this treatment in nine aligners. So let's try to see how it looks. We click OK to this. Then the software will automatically generate the, the nine steps. So here we have the original and then first aligner, second and so on until uh, aligner number eight. And then the final smile is the aligner number nine. So uh, let's let's have a look at uh, how that looks. If we play the animation, then we can see uh, step by step from the uh, malocclusion or the crooked teeth, step by step each aligner until the final treatment. What you will notice when you look at it that all the teeth are moving in the same direction at the same time in the same um, steps calculated. So it's kind of like in a complete linear operation and all of the things are happening in the same time that might not really be possible in real life so let's try to dig into the actual treatment and see what can we do in order to make it more um, a realistic a more realistic treatment so we have something we call a setup and a staging timeline it looks like this here you can see uh, the aligner the numbers of aligners that uh, is needed in order to uh, create the treatment we can see a combined uh, teeth movement on the teeth. So all of the teeth here, let me just take a view from the top because then we can see the teeth. So if I select the teeth that has movement, it's all the green teeth here. Then we can see that, that all of the movements is combined and that's why the line is green and uh, it's, it's running like this. But I can go in and, and check which teeth have rotations. All of the teeth have rotations. Inclination is only some of the teeth, so uh, the teeth that are red here, we are inclining them a little bit. Uh, these two does not have any uh, any rotation, but they do have inclinations and so on. So I can look into the treatment, what is actually going on throughout the uh, aligner treatment. And then I can also see uh, the, the speed of the teeth movement here in the, what we call waypoints. So in the first aligner, we have 0.19, uh, two nine uh, millimeters of movement uh, towards the end of the treatment but it's all happening in a linear uh, motion and we know that some of the teeth were able to uh, move faster than others so let's try to use the optimized teeth movement button this is uh, again going back to the, the control panel and, and the table that shows us uh, the individual teeth the calculation be, will be based on each teeth so if i click this button here then the scenario suddenly looks completely different because um, tooth number two five, uh, one five here is actually able to finish uh, its, uh, its tooth movements um, in three aligners. The only two teeth that requires uh, all nine aligners is tooth number two, uh, two four and tooth number one three. So if I want to uh, look a little bit more into the, um, the situation, I can, I can go and say to this tooth, okay, I know that there are some, um, some rotations going on, but maybe I would like to have the rotations not in the beginning of the treatment, but I want to have them a little bit later uh, down the line. So I will wait with the rotations 
two collisions maybe or, or, or what so and then the rotation will happen in aligner number five uh, six and seven instead of in the beginning and that will also reflect um, the, the waypoint and the speed if i think it's going too fast i can lower the speed uh, a little bit like this to a more slow curve and if i want to increase the speed well then i can just raise up the speed and that will of course if i go like like this then that will affect um, my timeline I can also set it to zero meaning that i will have a break uh, somewhere in the middle um, if i hit exactly the same height like that then you see there's a break uh, between aligner number four and five so this is just to show how you dig into the uh, aligner treatment and take control of what is happening at uh, at what state at what aligner and how fast this is going so super powerful tool here uh, in, in the orthodontic uh, uh, clear liner studio software all right uh, enough about the teeth movement i think you get the idea uh, more or less um, without me going completely into depth about um, uh, the whole situation uh, i can just show you that uh, you could select uh, a group of teeth let's say you want to um, extract the premolars then you simply click the teeth and you click uh, extract teeth and then the molars will be uh, extracted from the, the situation here yeah i know so <clears throat> Now you have space and, uh, and then you can grab a, a group of teeth. So we have to go back to the tooth movement, uh, grab a group of teeth, and then you can maybe uh, start to close the space or bring the teeth back and forward and so on. So let's see. Um, once I'm happy with the whole situation, I have all my setups, then I need to export them into uh, models that uh, will be ready for 3D printing. So I use this icon up here for, for export, <clears throat> sorry. And uh, you can see that uh, once we get to this, um, this, this step here, uh, all the models that will be exported will be the models that have uh, movements. So uh, it's only going to be the upper model that will be exported, not the lower. I can, however, choose to also export the lower if I want to have it, but you can check mark and uncheck mark that. And you can see that it exports into uh, the open file format STL. Then we can choose to uh, ID tag the model sets. So we can choose to uh, ID tag the, uh, the model uh, by this one. And then we can choose what we actually want to include in our ID tag. So uh, by clicking the plus here, I get a long list of different things that I can add to the model. Um, special numbers or uh, clinic IDs. If I want to uh, make sure that everybody is, is it might go to a production a person that doesn't know what's over and, and, and lower, or maybe not. The situation could be difficult to see. So you can add like this is an upper model and this is a lower model and so on. So we can do a, quite a lot of uh, ID tagging and you can put the ID tag either on the, uh, the side. You can also put it on the base uh, of the model and you can ID tag the molar so that the, uh, the patient knows that this is the first aligner and this is for upper and the other one is for lower. So they don't mismatch them. So basically all that I need to do is just uh, uh, select uh, the folder or the path where I want to uh, export it. You can export it to your desktop or you can export it into, um, I don't know, um, uh, the folder of your 3D printer or, or where you have the uh, preform software. And then you uh, click the uh, export and then all the models, these horseshoe based, uh, horseshoe shaped uh, models will be sent uh, into that software and uh, that is in a very <laughs> short time um, and a brief introduction on uh, on how you move teeth with the uh, free shape auto software i hope it was helpful otherwise please do uh, ask uh, any questions that uh, that you can come up with in the q a and i'll try to answer as many as, as possible <laughs> otherwise it's uh, back to you um, let me see i have to go and uh, yeah. On share, right? Oh, yeah, you, you can so, take control of the screen now. Uh, so, yeah, also you can keep on sharing if you want, uh, if it will be helpful to answering the Q&A. Uh, I can see a lot of, of uh, questions there. I think that, uh, that uh, a bit uh, consolidates what the polls uh, showed, that everybody is a bit concerned about the design part and the sub setups creation uh, to create enhanced liner treatment. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, maybe I can give you some time to check the questions uh, soon and maybe Dr. Yan can help. But there are a couple of recurring topics like importing a CBCT, uh, adding attachments, how long the segmentation takes, and uh, yeah, and can it be automatic? And some questions about importing uh, scans and files from third party intraoral scans. So I'll let you handle them. Yes, I will definitely look into that. Uh, I know that I didn't cover the attachment, but uh, I can quickly show you that there is an option that um, allows you to uh, uh, to look at, at each individual teeth. I mean, you, you can go and select a tooth and then you can select uh, uh, some uh, uh, attachments. So uh, you can bring in a box here and you can place an attachment uh, manually on, on a tooth and then you get these uh, control points where you can uh, you can adjust and and, and move them in, in into a desired position so you can do manual uh, attachment placement uh, but you can also uh, try to use the uh, automatic placement functions uh, let me just get my mouse straight uh, so if I select the teeth here and I go for the automatic placement then the software will look for uh, there's no movement in the final smile, of course, but there might be some movements in the in the beginning. So let me just go to the first uh, aligner and then let the software do uh, the analysis for this. So the software will look at at the the teeth movement um, uh, conditions, and if there's a movement that requires an attachment, meaning that the rules that you set up in the control panel is exceeded, then it'll automatically place an attachment on that tooth. So these two teeth here, they have um, uh, movements that that is bigger than what the force of the aligner is actually able to do um, to facilitate. So e either it has rotations, the aligner needs more grip to be able to um, uh, to do the rotation, or it needs to be uh, included or excluded, or or you want to have some um, retention uh, attachments uh, added onto this. Then the software will uh, will make the automatic attachments here. You can bring in any attachments to the library. So if you have a preferred shape or, or so on, then you can design that in a in a in a CAD software. You can uh, use it in Appliance Designer if you also have that, uh, or you can go online and uh, and use some of the uh, uh, the browser-based uh, CAD tools uh, that that will very easily create a a, a STL file uh, for import. There is actually also some freeware tools. Uh, even in, in Microsoft, there's a, one that's called 3D Builder that is uh, embedded as a free tool uh, that also helps you to uh, to make small designs of um, of attachments that you can then uh, implement into the software. So let me just uh, check the uh, the Q and A, uh, and yeah, Jan, feel free to uh, to fill in if uh, if you see some questions that I don't. Uh, I have it over here on a different screen. Um, so we're having a lot of questions about the sub steps uh, that we are making but uh, again coming back to your disclaimer let's say that uh, sub steps are often a discussion for the orthodontist or the well-trained uh, orthodontic uh, uh, general dentist uh, knowing how big uh, steps you can take uh, and so on but we have the tool as you said uh, in the software to to um, frame uh, and the prohibit from bigger movements than allowed and so on. So there are some limits uh, already set. Uh, can you comment a little bit more on that? Yes, I can also see uh, how do you add these. Uh, it's done in the control panel, so it's not it's something that you have to do prior to, uh, to your, your case planning, um, adding these attachments into the software. Um, and yes, of course, you need to have uh, an orthodontist to look at the case. So if, if you have no clinical uh, background experience, then, then you are only able to do a, a, a simulation or, or a trial setup that you then uh, send to the doctor and the doctor looks at it, fine tunes it, and then approves the case and sends it back. So there need to be a lot of uh, communication going on between uh, labs and clinics. Um, it's the same way we see with the the key aligner providers they also have either they have a, a platform um, where they have this uh, discussion going on or or they they simply you know call each other or email each other and and, and so on uh, we have the the three shape um, uh, communi communicate app uh, there's also three shape community but that's a different thing 
but the communicator app is is the place where you uh, have this discussion with with, uh, with with your orthodontist about the setups um can we design our own assistance yes that is definitely possible uh can you uh let's see uh, we have a question about uh, interproximal reduction uh, yes. how we can do that maybe that is a good uh, question to answer yes that's actually uh, we get that quite a lot i mean uh, what what we can uh, what we can activate in the software is that we can have the software perform uh, collision detections so if i activate that it will show me uh, the space that i have between teeth and then it'll also show me uh, the collision that we have so here we we do have some um, some collision with the neighboring teeth uh, but we also have some space with the other one so if i want to do ipr let's let's create a collision here 0.05 that's not a lot uh, you could choose to say i want to have a, a restricted teeth collisions that means that the teeth will not be able to collide with each other so you can move them until the maximum and then you can set up a threshold let's say you would like to have a, a little bit hard contact so 0.07 uh, might be uh, a, a good idea. Then, then you will be able to grab a tooth, move it uh, up to the collision, and then when you hit the 0.06, then you cannot move the teeth anymore. Uh, so it will simply stop. So that is a teeth coll collision restriction. Uh, and that can help you to create a, a hard contact point either to the neighboring teeth or to the, um, uh, to the, the uh, antagonist. Um, the opposite bite <laughs> yeah, for people who doesn't know what that is. If you want to do IPR, so let's say I, I do have a, a collision here of 0.6, then I can go to the uh, uh, IPR or where we are, we are stripping away, cutting away the file or a burr or, um, or some, some sort of um, uh, rotating uh, uh, disc. They, they remove a little bit of the uh, enamel of the teeth. We can do it virtually. It doesn't mean that the doctor will do it the exact same way. So uh, personally, I would prefer not to do it. The, I mean, you can do it the virtual way to, uh, to align the teeth in a, in, a, in a better way. But the risk is that once the treatment goes to the doctor, it might not look the same. So um, I would be a little bit careful about doing it virtually. Um, once, you, uh, let me show you how it's done here. So it says 0.06. I will use the manual way. So I will show the tooth, use the saw, and then we will get this down to a minimum because we are way below this one. You have to take a view, like from the top. This this would be the view of um, how how the clinician would would see it. So uh, we have a small round uh, circle here. If I drag between the teeth now, and then I let go then the file will cut a little bit of each teeth because we have um, like a rough diamond or sandpaper on kind of like a sandpaper on, on each side of the two. And then it'll simply file away some of the, um, some of the material of uh, each tooth. So now we have a space of uh, 0.1 as, uh, as, as we showed here. So I can apply um, IPR reduction on, on, on the teeth virtually, but it might not look the same when the doctor does it. He might be using a, a burr or she uh, uses a disc or, or, or similar. Um, but yes, you, you, can, uh, you can illustrate it this way. Uh, we have a question about uh, the attachments, uh, how to cement them in the correct position. So the question is, are we using the previous guide to that or is there a special, let's say, uh, guide for cementing the attachments? Usually what they do is that the, the first sub step you, um, where you have the first uh, aligner, uh, you, you print two of those or you, you do uh, two suck downs on, on that model. And then you, uh, you usually use a thinner material, uh, a thinner piece of plastic uh, for the attachment and you call it the attachment aligner. Uh, and then you fill in some uh, light curing composite into that uh, tray. And when you mount it onto the teeth, First, you need to prep the teeth, so you need to uh, uh, to clean the teeth, and then you need to um, etch and prime the teeth, and then you put in the aligner with the material, and then you light cure it on top. And when you then remove that thin aligner, then the uh, attachment will stick to the teeth. 
uh, and then you're ready to hand over the first uh, the first gear liner, uh, the first up setup to the patient, and then uh, take it from there. Um, yeah. And there was a following up question to that one. Uh, can I create my own attachments? It's definitely possible. Uh, it just has to be either DCM format uh, that FreeShape is working on, or it, it uh, needs to be an SDL format, uh, file format. But if you use that, uh, you can make a small uh, a ball or a small uh, triangle or a circle or, or a box or a star, whatever, whatever you can come up with that will facilitate um, uh, the right movement, then, uh, then you can bring it into the software. I also see that there are some questions about how, what is the price of the software. Uh, it is uh, quite extensive what, what the software is um, able to do. Uh, so I can understand that uh, people are eager to, to get their hands on it. Um, we don't sell direct from 3Shape. So you have to contact some of our resellers in, uh, in your local region, but uh, reach out to some of the, the, the dental um, resellers and they can definitely help you uh, on, uh, on a setup because it is very individual. Uh, how many machines would you like the software to be on and uh, what is what is your uh, either your clinic setup or your lab setup uh, and that also has an influence on, uh, on the price uh, so uh, can can we take one more main question uh before we uh, to keep the schedule before yes. we uh, actually we're gonna take the yoga break um with Della for 20 minutes. I've shared, shared in the chat a special uh, Spotify playlist that uh, the attendees can play while doing the yoga session. Uh, it will be very uh, re-energizing and relaxing. And then right after that, we'll jump into the 3D printing part. And uh, I don't want to deprive you from yoga, but, <laughs> but then maybe we can answer some of the questions uh, in parallel by typing. So one more question and then we move to yoga, please. OK, uh, yeah. Because I see, uh, I also see that time is flying, and that's it's nice. It's nice that people are interested in going digital. There's a question about uh, what kind of software uh, is this? This is the latest uh, official build. It's uh, 1.923. So if you don't have this, uh, contact your reseller and ask for uh, for an update. We are on a regular basis uh, updating the software, but it needs to go through our resellers at uh, at the moment because. Uh, uh, handling of file cases and so on um, is, is their uh, responsibility. So you can check your, your software by opening up uh, Auto Analyzer, and then in the right corner, we have the 3Shape logo. It's not just a logo, but if you click it, you get access to, um, to the, the version, but you also get access to online support, uh, training center, user manual, and let's change dentistry together, <laughs> send feedback. Please do send us feedback. We uh, read everything that comes in and we categorize it uh, accordingly uh, so that uh, the highest uh, priority of uh, uh, requests and, and changes and uh, yeah, inspiration uh, will be added onto the system. So uh, uh, do use this one. It's, uh, it's, it's how we make uh, uh, the whole dentist, uh, dentistry more powerful. <laughs> we do it together. So uh, yeah. I guess that's it for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. For now, I will I will yeah. try to answer as many questions in the in the Q and A also yeah. during this uh, yoga Amazing. session. Thank you very much, Sune. Uh, maybe you can just enjoy the yoga session. Uh, people also will enjoy that, so they can wait for the answers after the yoga session. Uh, so again, it was challenging trying to organize this virtual seminar for three hours, continuous three hours. So we're experimenting with new things. I hope you're gonna enjoy this uh, yoga session specially tailored for you guys by, by uh, Adela. Adela is also the yoga teacher that uh, teaches uh, form labs uh, yoga uh, during the week. Uh, I'm sure Srishet doesn't have that. <laughs> uh, so I give the floor for, um, uh, for Adela so um, she can uh, open the video and, uh, and, and start sharing with you the yoga vibes. Hello, does that work now? Yes, yes. it's working. I'm going to put you on the spotlight. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for Formlabs, for, uh, to Georgia for having me. Thank you all for giving me your time, but maybe also thank yourself for taking this time for yourself to get a little bit out of your head and into your body now, since you've really concentrated now, probably. 
and uh, yeah, it's nice to take the energy down from the head into the body and then you can focus better afterwards, I hope. Um, you don't need any yoga experience, just see how far you can go. Um, Giorgio, I think that we lost a little bit the connection with Della. Yeah, I think uh, so. there. Oh, Perfect. The yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. We can see again. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what happened here, but I'm back. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you want to practice with music, which is always nice, um, you could open this link in the chat. Otherwise, silent is also fine. And I'll tell you when to start it. But we will start in an upright seated position. We can see the yoga teacher. Can you see me now? Yes, it's clear and also hear you. Okay, because I just yeah, okay. chat and I said they couldn't see me anymore. Okay. Yeah, find an upright position. And then let your hands sink on the knees and the thighs and gently close down the eyes. It's nice to take a little rest for the eyes since we skip, stare into screens a lot these days. And then relax the point between the eyebrows. Relax the cheeks. Unclench the teeth. Notice if you're creeping the shoulders up towards the ears and just take them down, let them sink away from the ears. And then start focusing on your breath. Feel the sensations that come when you inhale through both nostrils and exhale out through both nostrils. Visualize your belly being a balloon that rises as you inhale and falls back and contracts as you exhale. Make the breath a little longer than usual. And that will help us to reduce cortisol in our bodies. It's a stress hormone. Deep inhale. And powerful long exhale. And then a way to relax easily is to focus on a short mantra, which today will be let go. So inhaling, silently say to yourself, let. Exhaling, go. Inhale, let. Exhale, go. And that's the only task you have here. Just focus on these two words. And finding stillness in the body. And whenever your mind wanders to a thought or a body sensation, don't judge it, but just simply draw the attention back to those two words. Inhale, let. Exhale, go.
Let the arms become very heavy. Once more, soften your face. And then take a long inhale. This time you can bring the shoulders all the way up to the ears. And exhale it out through the mouth. Let's do it once more. Long inhale, shrug the shoulders all the way up. Hold it here. And then let it all go. Let's do it one more time. You can be really loud because no one can hear you. I'm the only one making ridiculous sounds, so, but you can hear actually. Deep inhale. And let it all out. Beautiful. Then you can slowly start blinking the eyes open. Good. If you want to practice with music, now would be the time to start the playlist. I'm going to start it with you, but you will only hear it on your own device. Otherwise, the sound is a bit of a mess. And the first song is called Mrs. Dalloway. And then to sit back on your seat and then gently drop the head to the right right ear to right shoulder and then bring the chin to the chest and then the left ear to left shoulder inhale take it to the right Exhale, draw this half circle with your head, really gentle. Inhale, back to the right side, right ear to right shoulder. And then stay here. Feel this gentle stretch in the left side of your neck. And then inhaling, reach the right arm all the way up and just grab hold of your left ear. And gently pull the head a little more towards the right. And reach the left arm out to the side, palm faces up and bring the arm slowly up. Exhale and push it down, palm faces down. Really nice for your shoulders and your neck. Inhale, bring the arm up. Exhale down. We take a longer inhale and exhale, push the palm down nice. and then change sides, drop the head to the left, left ear to left shoulder, grab hold of the right ear and then slowly bring the right arm up, palm faces the ceiling, exhale, push it down, and do it very mindfully. Feel the supple sensations in the neck. Exhale, bring the arm down. One more time, inhale, arm up. Exhale, down. And then release. This time, both of your hands behind your head, interlace all 10 fingers. And then inhaling, stretch the elbows out to the side, bring shoulder blades together, really open the chest. That's nice if you've been sitting all day. And hold it here. Inhale, a little more back, the elbows and to the outside. And then exhale, bring the elbows together in front and round the spine a little bit, let the head drop. Inhale, open and expand. Elbows come out to the side, shoulder blades come together. Exhale, around. Once more, inhale, expand. Don't hold anything back. And exhale, around. Inhale, open, expand. And exhale, drop the arms down. Inhale, right away, reach both arms up, fingertips towards the ceiling. 
and then exhale, twist, bring the left hand on the right knee and the right hand behind you. Inhaling, you lengthen, so the crown of the head wants to come to the ceiling. And exhaling, see if you can twist a little more. Inhale, create space. Exhale, twist a little more, gaze slightly back. One more deep inhale. Exhale, find your center and then reach the arms back up once more. Inhale up. Exhale, twist to the other side. So right hand comes to left knee and left hand behind you. Inhale, reach up. Exhale, twist a little more. Gaze slightly over your left shoulder. Inhale, make sure you're one strong line with your body. And then exhale, see if you rotate a little more. Inhale. And exhale, come back to center. Nice. From here, make your way into a four foot position. So your hands are on the mat underneath the shoulders and the hips are stacked over the knees. So you wanna have a nice 90 degree angle in the legs. And keep the legs as they are. And then just walk the hands forward, come onto the fingertips and try to melt towards the ground here. So that's a really nice shoulder opener. Maybe you can bring the forehead to the ground. Deep inhale, deep exhale. See if you can melt your chest a little more towards the ground here, lengthen the spine. Breath in and powerful breath out. And then very slowly, gently come back Bring the hands again underneath your shoulders and then tuck the toes under, send the hips back and extend your legs and fly the hips up towards the ceiling for the so-called downward facing dog that you probably all know. Make sure your feet are hip distance apart and try to focus on lengthening the spine here. So the upper body wants to come towards the thighs you can bend the knees in the beginning. That helps a little bit to lengthen the spine. And don't forget to breathe. Long inhale. And deep exhale. Inhale fully. Exhale, extend the left leg towards the ceiling and then bend the knee towards your nose. Hold it here. And then silently place the left foot in between the hands. Exhale as you bring the right knee down, untuck the toes. Inhale as you come up to a low lunge, bring both arms all the way up. Exhale, sink a little more with your hips towards the ground. Good. Strong inhale. Exhaling, bring the hands behind your back and maybe you can grab hold of your elbows here. That's again a very nice shoulder and chest opener. Nice counter pose if you've been sitting like this all day. Deep inhale. Exhale, sink a little more towards the ground. Good. Breath in. Breath out. Maybe you can lean back for a little back bend even. Deep inhale. And exhale, frame the left foot with both hands, tuck the right toe under, and then send the left leg back, come back into your downward facing dog. Let's move right away, inhale, right leg all the way up towards the ceiling. Exhale, bend the knee to your nose. Inhale, place the right foot in between the hands. Exhale as you bring the left knee down to the ground. Strong core as you come up with both arms, really reach towards the ceiling. 
Exhale as we sink a little more into that lunge. Inhale, bring the arms together behind the back. Try to reach opposite elbows. That's not available, just try to reach the hands wherever you can grab contact. Deep inhale. Exhale, sink a little more and maybe if that's possible for you, bend back a little bit. Gaze slightly upward. Deep inhale. Exhale with mouth open. Inhale. And exhale, frame the right foot this time and then step it back into your downward facing dog. Three deep breaths here. You can walk your dog, which means bending the right knee, bending the left. Do whatever movement feels good for you now. Mm, deep inhale. And then exhale, we'll get more relaxed. Bring the knees wide apart, big toes touch, and then send the hips to sit on the heels arms in front of you and if possible bring the forehead to the ground or make a little pillow with your hands and rest the forehead there and try to come back to a long steady breath here Scanning your body for tension. And inhaling again, think to yourself, let. Exhaling, go. Silently repeat those two words. And send the exhalations to where you feel the stiffness, the stickiness in your body. Mm, deep inhale. And exhale out with mouth open. And then slowly, vertebra by vertebra, roll back up. And with as little effort as possible, Come to lie on your back. Soles of the feet very close to the buttocks. And then extend the right leg all the way up towards the ceiling. Toes flex towards you. And with both hands, grab behind the thigh. And then try to bring the leg towards you. Inhale. Exhale as you extend the left leg along the mat, flexing the toes towards you. Inhale, reach the arms above your head. And then exhale, expand in all three directions. So the fingertips pull towards the top of the mat, right foot towards the ceiling, and left foot towards the back of the room. Inhale. Exhale, bend the right knee into your chest, hold it here. And then change sides, this time place the right foot on the ground and extend the left leg towards the ceiling. Hands behind the thigh. And then pull it towards you, this leg. Deep inhale. Exhale, extend the right leg back, flexing the toes. Inhale, reach the arms above your head with the hands rest on the ground. And then expand everywhere. And deep inhale. And exhale, re-bend the left knee. Bring the hands on the shin and pull the leg towards you. Exhale as you release the leg down to the ground. Arms by your side. Let the feet drop outward. And then close down the eyes once more. For a final relaxation, we're going to stay here for some moments. There's nothing for you to do here. 
other than rest, other than splaying yourself open. And becoming very heavy. And then gently start moving fingers and toes and roll over to your right side using your right arm as a pillow. And when you're ready, come back up to a seated position. And taking another long, deep inhale, bringing the shoulders all the way up to the ears, and exhaling with mouth open. And then you can gently start opening the eyes again. And our 20 minutes are over. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed. I, could, I hope you could relax a little bit and I wish you a productive afternoon. This is your mat, Dr. Yan. Mm -hmm. Namaste. Thank you, Dada. That was amazing. Yeah, that was really good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so Ciao. much, Della. Thank you, people. Have a productive afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. <laughs> I'm, I'm launching a cool poll uh, to see if you uh, actually... The, ooh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. I cannot hear a word. Let's see. P-S-K-T-O-P 7-H-I-M-U-0-R. Now I can hear you. Sorry. Did you say something, Georgia? Yeah, I was, I was doing a small poll to see who actually joined the uh, session. So I think at least 50% uh, did that. So you had around 405, 400, 500 people doing that. So it's uh, pretty cool. Maybe if I can just add one more sentence. If you want to do more yoga, because this is really short, I always have an open class Tuesday evening online class from 7 to 8. And if you check Dila Yoga, Dila Yoga all together on Facebook, You'll find yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salam. Ciao, ciao. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, thank you very much uh, for uh, everybody for staying. I can see some people left and now are coming back, but I can see also that. Uh, a majority of the people sticked and actually are feeling energized after this yoga session. Uh, so thanks for staying and that was a bit experimental and we hope now that you're uh, ready and energized for the next 65 minutes that we have uh, together with you. Uh, we're gonna be focusing more on the printing part now. So just for if you're curious, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results with you. Uh, so here we go, like around 44% actually did it. Uh, 95 were tempted and 28% uh, were actually didn't do it. So uh, yeah, thank you everyone. Hope you're feeling relaxed and energized. Uh, now we go to the 3D printing part. Um, I'm gonna quickly share my screen uh, or actually let me see. So uh, basically now we jump into, into the part of, um, of uh, preform setup, setup and resin choice. Sorry, I'm feeling too relaxed <laughs> after the yoga session. Uh, so uh, now Jacob is actually gonna take us uh, through how you briefly choose your material to choose it on preform and then how you use the uh, user-friendly software of, of Formlabs called the preform that uh, that actually allows you to take the files that were generated from the clear aligner studio that suni showed to you and actually put them virtually into the platform of the printer so you can print them uh, jacob uh, the floor is yours yeah 
Thank you very much. Um, so we're now going to talk a little bit about the preform setup and resin choice. Um, I'm just going to be spending a little bit of time here um, as also Bernhard will show you a little bit later. So going back to the complete clear line of workflow. So we're currently in this third step of manufacturing uh, the uh, basically the model for thermoforming on top. And we have segmented this into multiple parts the choice of material, which is something that most likely a lot of you will be doing once and then most of our customers actually stick to the one material that they prefer. And then what we are also going to be looking at is preparing the design. And I'm also going to show you a little bit about the printing process and then the post processing will be a little bit more on Bernhard's side where he's also going to show you more on the thermoforming part. So let's get right into it and check out these materials first. So there's actually quite a few of them, um, considering all the dental shades. We have over 10 just alone in the dental space. The three that I'm going over here really quickly, like I said, Bernhard is going to show you a lot more in terms of details there, are the draft gray um, and dental model ones. And these three have very specific um, points to them and a couple advantages, disadvantages of all of them. Basically, most of our customers are using e the gray resin. Uh, some are also using the dental model. These are just general standard resins, which are basically in different shades right here. So it's basically your choice, which one you prefer. But you can also feel free to use the draft resin, which was first off made for um, 3D printing very, very fast. Um, so this can also be a thing to speed up your whole process. Um, yeah, so that's all I'm going to do here. Like I said, these are the three base ones that most of our customers use for the dental model production. Um, but Bernhard is going a little bit more in detail on the advantages and disadvantages there. So now what I wanted to show you was our software itself. And I hope you can see my screen right now. Maybe one of the other panelists can uh, just give me a thumbs up or so. Oh, thumbs yes, up. Thank you very much. Um, so this is basically what you'll be starting out with our preform software. As Giorgio has mentioned earlier, this is free on our website. So you can just visit formlabs.com and on top go to the software section and then download it for free. You can then just import your STL and OBJ files here. And even if you don't have a printer, yet, hopefully, <laughs> you can still just see how long these prints will take, how much resin they will take, and then you can just do a little bit of a calculation on if this is something that you want to invest in. So first things first, we always are greeted with this job setup page where we are selecting the material that we want to use. Um, as you can see, there's quite a list here. I'm just going to be using the gray resin. As I said, most of our customers are actually using this. And then you can also select the printer that you want to use for your print setup. I'm using the Form 3B here because that's also what I have uh, sitting right next to me. You will also be selecting the layer height right here. Um, this is basically a choice on how fine the surface finish is supposed to be in the end. Um, so this will also cut into the time. So basically it's a little bit of a selection that you will have to make on either you want a very fast print or one that has the nicest surface finish possible. For thermoforming a liner, using the faster print settings is more than fine enough, but Bernie will show you a little bit more on that. We just hit apply here. And then we're basically off to the race. I have already input a couple models here. Um, it's basically the same model in different variations that I want to show you, but you would just typically be going into the file settings and then just hit open as you would with a lot of other softwares. So in here, like I said, I have the same model uh, just multiple times as I want to show you a couple uh, differences here, but typically you would have just one model of every single step, for example, in your um, dental model. So what I'm going to be showing you here is basically there are different ways of working with the software. It's actually pretty straightforward and you can actually just let the software do a lot on its own. Um, and then just like I mentioned earlier in this webinar is every minute that you want to spend additionally can actually save you a little bit of time in the post-processing or just in terms of resin resin consumption and also in time in the printing process itself. So the easiest thing that you can do is just go to the up, upper left here and we have this little wand right here, which is a one click print option, which you can use. And then you can basically just hit this set up print um, button right here and then have everything be manually done in a couple of minutes 
already be sent off to the printer and then you just have to go over to the machine and press start there, which is something I'm gonna show you a little bit later on. But if you wanna go in and do a couple of these things yourself, I'm just gonna be hiding these other models um, just for a couple of minutes here. Basically what you will be doing is you will go over on the left side where you have all these tools available to you. And the first thing that we're going to do is the orientation of our models themselves. Typically speaking, there is there are two big orientations that you want to strive for. You either want to go for something like this, where you have your models just straight up on the build platform itself. This is something that a lot of people will do. But as you can imagine, if you have your whole arch in the model, the build volume right here like this, you can fit six, maybe seven models at the same time. Um, but the advantage of doing it like this is as you don't have a lot of printing height to it. And that is one of the factors that um, basically affects your printing time by quite a bit. Um, this will typically take around three to five, maximum six hours-ish to print these six or seven models right there. But the other big one that you can do is if you have a model that you cut off at the end with a planar cut, just like this one right here. You can also just use the select base feature to just go in and then you can just also put it on the backside and then you can print these models upright like this. Um, as is also a variant that you can do, um, most likely we will be adding a couple of supports, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But as you can see right here, this takes up much less space on the build platform itself. So you can feel free to add quite a lot more in terms of models right here. The print will take longer, but as you can also just leave the machine running overnight, this is something that Eliza will show you a little bit later on. Um, this is something where you can also do a mix and match of both of these things where if you're coming into the lab in the morning let's say a let's say 8 a.m or so you're starting a print right then and you want to have something that you have finished about lunchtime let's say you would just be putting your models flat on the build platform itself and then if you have a little bit more time let's say you're ending your day at like four five six p.m ish then you don't really care if your print is done at 8 p.m in the evening or if it's done 1 a.m the next morning if you're in the next morning at 7 or 8 a.m again you don't care if the printer uh, has been standing for six hours or for two hours, but what you do care about is whether or not you have seven models or 25 models, well, that's quite a bit much, let's say around 16 or so maybe done on the build platform. Um, so this is also something where you have a little bit of a choice to yourself. And this is also one of the things that we strive for to basically leave you to do whichever one you like better. So after we have basically decided for an orientation, as I said, either flat on the build platform or upright, the next step that we would be doing would be to go into the support settings right here. As you can see right up top, there is just a button to automatically generate all the supports. For something like this model on the left here, where I have it just flat on the build platform, I will not need any supports. But for something that is upright like this arch right here, I will every once in a while need a couple supports just to be supporting the arch itself so that it prints uh, in the best way possible. But also a thing that can happen sometimes is that if you have an arch upright like this, you can have a couple minimas that are coming out throughout the print. And here we actually have a couple automatic functions as well to help you with this. You will see on the right side that the printability check in Preform will actually give you a thumbs down and tell you, hey, this is not printable right now. Please check what you're doing right there. And you can actually see that I have this little button over here, which tells me that I have two unsupported minimas. I can actually click this in and then I will see that I actually have one over here in the writing itself and I have one on the bottom side right here where the edge just bends over. And these minimas basically means that if we're going through this additive process where we're adding these layers on top of each other, that we have something that is just printing in midair and would just stick to the bottom of the build tray. I will show you what I mean by that in a minute. Um, but basically while we're going through this printing process, you can also look at it by using the slider on the right side. We can basically see that a little bit later on, we'll have this little piece right here, which is just hanging in midair and we can't have any parts of our model just hang in midair. So this is something that we will need to take care of. If we just leave everything on standard, 
I can just auto generate the supports for this one model right here. I can either click on a couple specific models that I want supports to be generated on, or what I can also do is I can just click like I did right now. I can just click on one model to have supports be generated. Or if I don't click in on any of these models, I can just have generates uh, supports be generated for all of these uh, models at the same time. As you can see right here, I actually did something that I didn't want to do. So I actually did a, uh, made a little mistake here. Um, you can see that the minimas are solved right now due to the automatic uh, function right here. But the problem is that the whole model is being propped onto supports and that you can also see that you actually have a couple supports on these teeth surfaces right here, which we generally do not want to have. So the first thing that we can solve is not having the model be propped up on supports because we have this nice and planar cut on the back that we did we can actually change the raft type. Instead of having the full raft, which means this whole base that you saw at the bottom there, we can just shift this over to have no raft at all. And then if I go back into generating rafts, uh, to generating supports, sorry, I can actually have supports just be generated where we actually need them and don't have the whole model be on top of supports. This will basically cut down on your printing time and it will also cut down on resin consumption right here. But as you can see, this is actually quite a lot of supports um, and there are supports that are in places where I generally would not want to have them. So an alternative to just using the automatic functions with everything on stock standard is that you can actually play around with these values or the way I actually like uh, to do it is to not use this automatic function at all. You can use it as a support and that's just fine. But me being a little bit on the lazy side, I like to actually just spend a minute here extra. And then you can go into the support edit mode. You don't have to clear out on this, all the supports first. Um, you can do this while having the supports be generated at first. I can just go in here and I can just set supports where I really actually do need them and where it's easy for me to take them off. I'm just pressing left click here to support these parts right there. I can also go in here on this detail. I'm actually going down in touch point size right up here. So that basically makes this little point much, much smaller and actually makes it easier for me to take this off. In this case, it might be easier to not have this um, island be created due to this um, writing right there to either have the writing be um, coming out of the model, so not be embossed, but be raised basically. That's one of the solutions that I can do there, or I can just leave the model be printing flat on the build platform itself. So, and then you can see these red shadings right here. This is basically also just Preform helping you out with this. And then you can just add a couple more supports in and seeing how many supports you need to actually get rid of all of these red shaded areas is something that will come with experience. You can see that I actually do not have a lot of supports right now. We'll just add a couple more from what in my experience would be a good amount of supports and a sufficient amount of supports. I'm still seeing some minimas right here, which I would have to take care of. I'm skipping it right now, but you really shouldn't for printing purposes. But you can just generally see how little in terms of supports I have here. So this is much easier for me to take care of. And I can specifically, if I know I want uh, my aligner to go a little bit further down, I can actually take these supports and just go back in, clear them out and just push them a little bit further. Or if I see later that I actually needed a couple more, I can just go in and just add the couple that I really actually need. And this is something, again, where it's basically your choice, preferably. So a lot of people will just opt for the automatic support generation. Then they will just cut out a couple of supports where they don't think they actually need them. But there's also quite a few people like me who are just going into the edit mode from the get-go and just add the supports where they think they actually need them. And then, if we have our, all our models basically prepared, I'm just gonna duplicate the same models a couple times to just show you a neat little trick that you also can do with the preform software. Typically speaking, you would not have the same model over and over again, you would have separate models, but we have this layout function on the left side right here where you can go in and just tell preform, uh, a lot of people will actually like start to do kind of a Tetris game right here to align all of their models on the build platform. But you can just go in here and tell Preform to do a model spacing, for example, of 0.5 millimeters, and then tell it to lay out all of these models. And it will basically start pushing around your models on the build platform itself, and then give you something 
or you can send it to the printer right here. For example, it showed me something that is that could be very nice, but actually in order to do the 0.5 millimeter of spacing, it actually shoots over the build platform a little bit. And don't worry if that kind of thing happens, it will make these models bright red and it, you will also not be able to upload it to the printer. So I have to push these in a little bit. But what you can do alternatively is just click the layout all button again, and you can do this multiple times. This is true for all of these automatic functions, where if you think that was okay what it did there in terms of automatic supports, for example, or automatic layout, you can just give these buttons another click and have a new alternative that it basically will show you for this. So this is basically how we would be using the software to orient our models itself. And then as a last step, we would just be going over to this orange button on the left right here, which is sufficiently named start a print. And then from this list, you will just generally select your printer. Mine is currently not um, in here because it's turned off, um, but you would just select your printer here and then upload the job to the printer and then start it on the printer itself. So this is generally how you would be using the software itself. Um, and as you can see, it basically really just takes a couple of minutes to do this kind of thing. Um, but I want to show you a couple of different methods of also preparing your models for putting them into the software and then using them in here. So these two models that I have right here are basically just different in one little thing where this model is basically what I've just taken out of 3Shape itself. And then the secondary one where I showed you where we have this nice and planar cut at the back to put it upright to have this RGB printing in that kind of way. But what we can also do is hollow our model. So I have two variations of that right here. Let me actually just take out this one right now. So these two models are hollow. You can't see it right now, but if we use the slicing tool on the right side again, we can actually see that I have them just with a super thin wall inside. If I remember correctly, I did around uh, 1.5 millimeters of wall thickness, which is totally fine for these kind of models and have them be completely hollow. And this can actually help you with quite a lot of um, basically uh, cost of resin because this will save you quite a bit. We can just go through here and we see how hollow these models are. And if you right click them, this is the exact same model right here. Let me just put them right next to each other so you can see. So this is the exact same model. This left one is just hollowed out. And if we actually right click on a model and go to model properties, we can see how much resin this takes. So this takes 4.5, around about 4.6.5, uh, sorry, 6.5 milliliters of resin right here. And the full arch, which I haven't hollowed out, takes around about 15.25 milliliters of resin. So this is less than half of the resin that we would be using in this type of case. And this is actually something that we recommend to get the most value out of the resins. And one thing you have to remember though, if you're printing hollow models, as we're dipping these models, we're gonna look at that in a minute, uh, as we're dipping these hollow models back into the liquid resin again and again, during the printing process, there's actually an effect that can happen, which is a so-called suction cup. Imagine you take your teacup and you wanna just um, rinse it out in a, a bowl of water and you would push it in and you would feel the same thing or basically pushes back. And we have to solve that suction cup issue right here. And you can see it where either you can put in Technically, you only need one hole. I like to do two just for venting reasons when you um, basically wash the whole model out at the end. Um, so you can either just put in a hole or two at the back of your model where it's not really visible, or what you can also do, and this is a little bit of a combination of two things where a lot of people actually like to do a little bit of a plain cut at the end at a roughly 45 degree angle, just to get in there with a the spatula and be easier to take your models off. You can also just use this as a venting hole for the model itself. So you have a little bit of a two in one, so you don't need to cut in any holes. You just cut off it planer at the back and then it's open at the same time, time while being able to take it off the build platform. Um, very, very easy. And then um, the last thing I wanna show you right here, we were looking at this model that was basically upright at the very beginning. So this one right here, you remember from a minute ago. So basically this model is already pretty good, 
But if you look very closely on this right one right here, you can actually see that what I did was I used the sculpting tool to just smooth out this inner part right there. And this is also something that is just a thing of um, basically experience where I've looked at this model in the model builder and I saw already, hey, I can see this little bump right here. And this will very likely form a minima if I turn this upright. So while I was still in the model builder, I basically used the sculpting tool to just smooth it out a tiny bit. So if we do it right now and put it on the back side again, again, I just went over to the orientation tool and I used the select base feature. If you do that, basically your mouse becomes this little plane with an orthogonal on it. And then you can just click on any planar surface and have it be flat on the build platform. So that is a very, very useful function. And now because I have this, this arch smoothed out on the inside, going through it again, you can actually see that it's only now just one minima, which came from the um, letters again. But if we go through this whole thing with the slider right here, we can actually see that this is now much, much smoother, smoother on this arch that we're forming there so we don't need a support there anymore. We can still put in one or two just to be on the safe side and just to support this model while it's printing out. But this is basically a very easy way of just helping your printing process and not use as many supports while at the same time just doing a little bit of an extra thing before you even put the models into preform. And this is basically generally how you would be using the software. Um, there, as you can see, there isn't really a whole lot to this. Of course, there are even more additional options that you can have if you really want to. There's a lot of things that you can set there. But as you can see, you can also just live with just doing a couple clicks here and sending it off to the printer pretty fast. Um, and then you can basically mix, mix and match whichever you prefer. Do you want to just go fast, have it be sent off to the printer and be done with it, print it and clear it out afterwards? Or do you want to spend a minute or two extra and then save on some resin or just, just some printing time? And then you can do whichever fits your needs in the best way, basically. And with this, it's already time to again hand off to the next person. If I remember correctly, it should be Bernhardt's turn right now to give you a little bit more on the next workflow, basically, on the post-processing. And with this, I hand off to Bernhardt. Um, thank you, Jacob. Or do we have uh, some more questions? Yeah, I, I think maybe we can take two minutes sure. before Bernhardt uh, starts. Uh, there were a lot of uh, questions in the Q&A part. Yeah. Uh, so one of uh, the repetitive question is, I think, is concerning Dr. Jan and Sune as well is regarding uh, the hollowing. When you're exporting the models, the sub setups and killer liner studio, can, can you hollow that or? Uh, yes, the models can be hollowed uh, afterwards, um, either using uh, uh, third party software or uh, uh, some of the printing software is also able to, uh, to hollow the models prior to, uh, to printing. Uh, we are thinking about uh, implementing that into the software in, in a coming uh, update version uh, of it. I don't think it's going to be before we have it actually on dental desktop. Um, but yes, we do get uh, that question quite often. Um, oh. But again, simple uh, CAD tools can do it. And, uh, and, and yes, they can be hollowed prior to, uh, to 3D printing. Um, I see there's a question, maybe uh, Jacob, um, uh, there's one that's creating uh, SX retainers. Um, this is this is a special plastic material, and um, uh, it's a common issue that the digital workflow uh, at the end it feels very tight. Is that due to the material, or is it there a way that we can um, actually adjust the digital printed file? Um, I know that we can in other software we can offset. Uh, kind of like the size of the the material, but is there any way in preform? that you can have a uh, offset of your models before you print them so that if the aligner is very tight or if they are very loose, that you can actually resize uh, the, the models that, that, um, that so you need for them. 
So I think also Bernhard can uh, go into here in a second and give a couple more tips as he's much more familiar in, in that area. Um, but there is a scaling feature in Preform, but that was scan, scale the whole model itself, basically. But if you just want to be like 0.1% extra or so to make it a little bit looser or a little bit tighter, then um, I can share my screen again. That would be this one right here. Now you should be able to see my screen again, I hope. So if you feel like, so generally speaking, I would always recommend uh, doing an offsite like this uh, in the software before exporting it as an SDL file. That is usually a bit cleaner and a bit easier to do. But if you do want to scale models, you can definitely do that. It's on the left side right here, right under this um, wand that you have. And the next one right under it would be the sizing feature. So that is for scaling. And then you can go in here and then 1.0 would be 100% scale. And if you want to, let's say, add 0.1 of a percent, you can even go in here and scale it up or down by 0.1%. Right now, you don't see really anything happening um, as it's just 0.1%, but you can even go bigger. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, but, I, I, but, but that is actually what, what will be enough because then, then you can troubleshoot if, if, your, if your stock down material turns out to be a little bit more tight fitting than, than others, then, then you can actually troubleshoot by, by going 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, yeah. and so on, I, on until I, it's really good. I would like to add something here because we are scaling then in a percentage value. So we don't have any control of the actual offset. It is not, it is depending on the volume or the, the size of the model. So if I'm taking 1% of, of a cube that has two centimeters, it will be like two millimeters, right? And if the, um, if, if the model is bigger, this value will be bigger. So it's not the best way to control actually the fit of the aligner. It should be done in the cut software with a real offset setting. So I actually see there are um, a couple more questions towards um, the, the preform software. So there are a couple of questions on hollowing out model. Just as soon as said, um, this is a, a thing that will also come into 3Shape in the near future. A software that I'm using that is actually free is called Mesh Mixer. There's a very nice and easy to use hollow function in there, which can also input suction holes into your model by just double clicking on um, the model itself. And then I see a couple questions on doing different types of supports and how to solve red shaded areas. Just to um, basically go over that uh, real quick again. So let me just very quickly just put this model on the back side again. So for this, we would go into the support function right here. And then you can do different types of supports either. So the first one is the raft type that you have to select for this type of model where I want it on the build platform, but I still want a couple of supports. The raft type would be none so that there is no additional base. Otherwise, if you just select the full raft, the whole model will be lifted up and have a raft at the bottom. So that would be something that you would be doing for something like surgical guides or, um, yeah, or other type of models, for example. You Typically speaking for models, I would generally be printing them on the build platform itself. Um, and then for this, I would just go to none. And then if you do have um, a couple of red shaded areas, let me just generate supports under here and hope that there are some red shaded areas. Um, one of the things that helps me personally while using the preform software, I can see that a couple of you have questions and they seem to come from already using the software. We can see that there are some red shaded areas right here that would be taking off the support. One of the things that helped me quite a bit is stopping to think in up or down in terms of preform. Because if you look at it like this, as this is basically upside down, this can get confusing quite fast. So that the way I'm thinking about preform and when looking at these models, and that also helps me with these red shaded areas, is not thinking of up or down, but what prints first and what prints last. So basically, typically speaking, these red shaded areas means, hey, be careful, this is an area that is not well supported. So this red shaded area here is not well supported. So I don't even want there to be a under supported or not well supported area at all. So in order to get that basically out of there, I have to stop it from even becoming a red shaded area. So I have to put a support in before in terms of time, right? So I support this area 
um, before it even becomes red. So this is also something, a technique which can help you cut down on the amount of supports quite drastically um, because what I see a lot of people do as they see a big red shaded area like this one and they will put a support in, in the middle of it. But the support that I'm placing right there can't help me with any of this area that's right here because that has already printed in an under supported or not well enough supported way. So putting the support instead of putting it right in the middle of this red shaded area, putting it at the start basically or before it even becomes red shaded, you can see that this takes off uh, a lot of this red shaded area right here. And then you can do the same thing where you just left click a support and just reposition it to basically start out earlier in this way. And then this red shaded area here, of course, I don't want to put my support in here to have this be solved, but maybe I can put it somewhere here where it's printing earlier and then it helps me get rid of this red shaded area. And seeing how much of a red shaded area you can ignore and where you should put in supports is also a thing that will come with experience. Yes, it would be nice if on your model there were no red shaded areas at all, but you can definitely print with a couple of red shaded areas. Uh, uh, Jacob, like here in general, I'd like to reiterate on things. So we tried to move our full day workshop into a three hour seminar where we get your uh, attention throughout three hours. So there are a lot of details that we can actually cannot, uh, we do not have time to go through uh, during the seminar. However, if you're interested in getting into more details, I, I think uh, Jacob can share some a link in the chat where you can register for some of his private one-on-one um, -on -one sessions. I think same for 3Shape Academy. If you get want into a deep dive into specific questions and a bit more learning how to do these things, then you can sign up for these courses. So I, I guess uh, now we should uh, go on and uh, switch to Bernard. So the next step is basically going more into details on what are uh, our material range for a clear aligner production and uh, the steps of actually the 3D printing part. So Bernard. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Jakob, for your demonstration. I think uh, you made it really visible how easy to use the software is actually. And by the way, it is completely free. Um, so um, whoever wants to try it out can download it now and even try it out without having a printer because there's a virtual printer integrated. So now we have our prepared models. Uh, they're prepared for printing. And now we're stepping into the practical part, which consists actually uh, of printing, post-processing, and the projection of the actual aligner. First, however, we will discuss the resin choices more in depth than Jakob did, because like uh, we want to um, shed a light uh, in perspective of speed, accuracy, and also economics. So uh, in general, we have four resins in our portfolio that are suitable for model make making. And uh, Jakob already mentioned that uh, uh, they are gray, dental model draft, and white. Uh, I, don't, I think Jakob didn't uh, mention white, but I will uh, explain why I consider it as a model making um, resin also. Each of these resins has its own advantages and application possibilities. So um, some are in our product range for a long time, even before we were active in the dental field and were never intended to be used by dental professionals. Um, so in the next steps, I will uh, walk you through the advantages and implication of each. So let's start first with the gray resin, with, uh, which would be the first choice um, for um, models for uh, thermoforming actually, and is also um, the one that has been adapted by dental users from the fir very first hour, even before we launched our dental model material, with, which was uh, specially designed for dental models. It has the best ratio between precision and speed, and it has a super fast layer thickness sec setting of 160 microns, which makes it an, an ideal uh, resin for printing models in your aligner production. But let me explain a little more uh, what we mean by layer height. I think Jakob mentioned it a little bit, but generally speaking, uh, 3D printing means that we are printing layer by layer. 
and an, a layer is defined uh, by each each uh, its height uh, in the preform settings. And this value uh, is measured in micrometers. So this means like if you're setting uh, 50 microns layer height in preform, your layer in the printed object will layer by layer 50 microns height for each. So different resins have different layer heights availability according to the activation. Uh, in our case, we're talking now about gray. It will be 50, 100, and 160. And uh, the key, um, key point here, the general formula uh, you have to think uh, about is um, like a rule of three, which means um, doubling the layer height means cutting down by half the print time but at the same time reducing the re resolution and thus uh, having a less nice rendered uh, surface. So has, how does uh, resolution actually affect the surface? In this picture, if you look at the vertical areas, you see that uh, stacking layer over layer doesn't really affect um, the form this much, but if you're coming to a more horizontal phase, you see actually how steps are affecting um, the, the rendering of the surface. So this is one thing we can leverage if we're doing uh, aligners because um, especially in the anterior aesthetical region, um, we have in the frontiers a very large part that is vertical or very little convex. So actually that's um, the main reason why um, printing um, models with a higher layer um, setting um, for thermoforming doesn't affect so much um, the actual uh, aesthetics of the liner. Uh, let's come back to uh, the gray resin. Um, we have, uh, as Jakob mentioned, different possibilities to do a print setup. The one we recommend for the most precise and accurate uh, models is to um, print them flat on the build plate but you could also print them on supports at an angle uh, of up to 19 degrees. Um, we always, by the way, we still always recommend um, printing flat on the build plate if you can um, from the room, for example, uh, or uh, the volume of print you have. Um, however, if you have a larger number of models to be printed, like uh, let's say a bunch of models that you want to print overnight for the next day, you still can print them on, on supports. So it gives you more room on the build plate, uh, but they will be less accurate. Talking about accuracy, uh, we can see in this graph that even with the biggest layer height of uh, 160 micrometers, um, the gray resin is uh, quite accurate. We see a deviation of only 100 micrometers over 93% of its surface. So this is actually very comparable to stone plaster. And there are a lot of um, studies out there that actually have been proving that the accuracy and tuners of models from SLA printers like the from 3B um, are very equivalent to tradi traditional stone models. And if we take a, a look at the clinical result of an aligner produced on such a model, this one was printed with 160 microns, it is actually very satisfactory. Um, it, it shows not a very uh, visible layer lines uh, because what you see if you're looking at this aligner in the patient mouse is mostly uh, the vertical faces. And they have only very little convexity. If you look closer, um, you will see that you can detect some layer lines in the incisal ed edges. Uh, but again, like it is in the mouse and the saliva is also helping a lot about disguising this effect. So the next possibility in model production uh, would be to choose the dental model resin, uh, which is a very, very close um, relative of the gray resin. It is actually almost the same resin, but uh, with a different color. For the moment being, uh, we don't have layer settings um, higher than 100 microns for this uh, material for the form 3B, but this will be available in the future. You can still print on the form 2 with uh, layers above 100 microns. 
this resin is very suitable for users um, who want also to print uh, prominent bridges in models in addition to the aligner production. And indeed, uh, the color is based on th that of standard stone plaster and is especially friendly to your eyes. This helps a lot when you're, for example, working with um, two shaded restorations. Dental model has, in fact, been uh, developed exactly for this purpose. So it is the one resin we have in our portfolio that is actually the one uh, model resin that has actually been designed especially with uh, dental users in mind. It is also the most precise uh, model we offer, uh, model resin, sorry. Um, the third option, and this is someone, uh, something uh, Jakob didn't mention, would be to take another standard resin, uh, which would be the white resin. As I said, it is, it is a standard resin, which means it's a general purpose resin. It was never meant to be a model for model, uh, a resin for model production. And we have no plans uh, in making a uh, layer height above 100 micrometers available in the future. So this is kind of excluding it from fast liner production, but in its main advantage would be to have very beautiful looking uh, models for archive and study, mo study models. Uh, for example, if you want to have a nice model to communicate with your patient about the treatment um, or for um, archiving models for uh, documentation for legal reasons. So um, we were talking about gray 160 um, of being the quite fastest um, possibility, but let's uh, talk again about speed. Uh, in example, if you have an urgent case where a patient that wants to go, for example, on a vacation and needs a replacement aligner, or even if you forgot to print a model for an existing appointment and don't want to cancel the appointment, then draft would be the way to go because uh, this is our, our resin, uh, our, our only, only resin that prints with uh, 300 micron, micron layer height. And it can indeed be used for thermoforming models. Um, we still um, recommend to print it flat on the build plate. Uh, and it can build a model in up to, like a horse show model in up to 20 minutes. Uh, the price is very similar to the uh, price of the gray resin, but as it is less accurate than uh, gray or dental model, it is not really suitable for vertical printing. So this can be seen in this graph because here uh, the deviation we are looking at is 200 microns. You remember on the gray one, we were looking at 100 microns. So, but uh, that said, uh, we still have a very improved print accuracy on this resin. Um, on the form three um, compared to the form two. And uh, again, you will be probably worried about visible layer lines in the aligner. So let's take a look at this picture. Uh, I know that this is not the sharpest picture we ever took. Uh, it was taken with a, a smartphone, uh, my apologies for this, but the clinical result shows almost no aesthetical disadvantage. And as I said, uh, this is not for large, um, scale production of a liner. But for those really urgent cases where time is really uh, crucial, it could save you from canceling a patient appointment. And again, we're taking a closer look at the internal edge. And I think uh, that the patient in this case wouldn't even notice the visible uh, layer lines in the internal edge. Or if he would, uh, he, he wouldn't, uh, probably be very disappointed about it because it's like it's a minor default. So and we're coming back to print speed comparison. So in this example, we have a build plate with nine horseshoe models flat on the build platform. And we have calculated the print time of these models for different resins and different uh, resolutions. And you can see that you actually, for example, for gray resin, you have a time saving of 20% stepping up from 100 microns to 160 microns. And even more for the draft resin. Again, this is not meant for thermoforming, but it is indeed useful. Uh, you can be even 63% faster than uh, gray 160. So draft outperforms our, all, all our dental resins in speed, but 
it renders a less accurate surface. Then we also will have a bigger version of our printer, which will be called the Form 3L. Uh, it uses the exact same technology and it has three times the build plate size. So this could be an option for large volume model production, uh, but keep in mind, larger print volumes will also need more time to print. So this is not an option for fast printing during the day. This is more big volume printing overnight. In a dental office, we don't recommend to do this for two main reasons. First of all, uh, on the Form 3L, you won't be able to print any biocompatible materials in the future. Like for example, our dental LT for splints or a surgical guide for surgical guides. Uh, so the better strategy would be to get, in this case, um, a Form 3B if you want to scale up your production capacities. Since then, you can uh, be using it in a more flexible way. You can, for example, uh, run prints in parallel and even with different materials, or for example, have a second printer ready to print for urgent cases. So you have your CAD file and uh, of the aligner model, and you have chosen your resin, and Jakob showed you very well how um, easy uh, it is to set up the print in preform. So let's come back on this topic a little bit and talk about orientation and support. Printing flat on the build plate is still recommended uh, for the most accurate models. And uh, as Jakob already mentioned, it is also the fastest solution. Um, if you want to print with support, please orient the models at 15 uh, degrees or um, greater and closely inspect your models. And this uh, Jakob showed also very well um, that you don't have um, supports touching areas where you don't want to see them like on the two surfaces or in the gingiva. Um, you will have to remove these supports manually uh, later, which affects the model accuracy and thus the fit of the aligner. And for improved print consistency, if you're putting models on supports, we recommend uh, to increase uh, the touch point size to 0.7 millimeters. So then that's, I think that's for my part. The next thing would be uh, after setting up the prints in preform as Jakob showed, uh, you, uh, you only have to click the little orange button to send um, the print to your printer. And please make sure that your printer is in the same network as your printer, uh, like uh, in your local area network or Wi-Fi, because otherwise you wouldn't see it. And I think next Jakob will give us a live presentation on uh, how to set up the printer. Yes, that is correct. I'm currently not at the computer anymore. If, um, George, if you could maybe focus me and tell me when that is the case. Yeah, so uh, Bernard left the, print, uh, left the presentation and I, you should be on the spotlight now. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to very quickly show you how easy it is to actually set up the machine and then we're going to go through the printing process itself really quickly. Um, so basically, except for the printer itself, there are three main things that you need. First of which is a resin tank. So that's basically the resin bath that always sits at the bottom. These come in these nice, I call them lunch boxes, uh, but these come in these nice handy boxes here that you can keep the um, tanks in. And then basically all you do is you just need to take it out of the box, insert it into the printer at the bottom. And then when it's nicely inserted, you will also hear a little beeping sound for the printer that it has detected like this, that there is a tank now in the printer itself. You will need a build platform. And this also just goes in at the top here. You just open up the lever at the top, slide it in and close the arm again. And then lastly, we need the material itself, which always comes in, the, in these, we call them cartridges. There's always one liter of material in these cartridges right here. And you will just put that in the back and then open up 
the air vent that sits at the top. And that's everything you need to do in terms of preparation of the printer itself. And it will be very similar if you want to switch resins to another one. So basically you would just do all of these steps in reverse, take out everything, and then just take your secondary resin, which you want to use. Maybe you want to use a different color or a whole different application and just put all of these things into the printer and then start a print in the different resin. And that's all you have to do on the hardware side, basically. So I will now go over back to my PC and show you a couple of things on the printing process in and of itself. So there actually was a question in the chat already on what the difference in between the SLA and LFS process is. And the stereolithic the LFS process, the low force stereolithography process, is basically a new subcategory of this stereolithography process, which we had in the Form 1, Form 1 Plus, and Form 2. Basically, what I have right here in this picture there. Uh, sorry, like, uh, Jacob. Uh, yeah? Please, everyone, you can uh, click on uh, speaker view on top right uh, corner of your screen to see Jacob alone on, as, as a big screen ah, okay. if you don't see him. The spotlight Thanks. didn't do that automatically. Okay, cool. So, Right there, sorry, it's mirrored for me. <laughs> so I've been doing that a lot. So in here, basically, I've taken a printer and I've just cut it from the front. So we see this uh, resin tank at the bottom there, which is filled with resin and our build platform up top. And I've cheated a little bit because I basically stopped time in the middle of a print process. It's a bit easier to show that way. So the first thing that always happens in during this print process is that we take the build platform with whatever we already have printed and we dip it into the resin tank and into the resin. Basically, we dip it in there until it is just shy of the bottom of the resin tank. And how far away it is and how much material there is in between what we have already printed and the bottom of the tank is basically determined in the software. You can remember where we had this little drop setup page where I could select print this at 160 or 100 microns or even 50 or even further down. Basically, that is the distance that we now leave in between what we have printed and the bottom of the tank. So that's also how we limit how far the laser goes into the um, resin itself, basically. Due to the resin tank bottom being very nice and flexible so that by pushing in, we don't have a lot of forces on the top um, side of parts. Basically, we now need to push the resin that's, that's way too much away to the side. And we also need to make a nice building area. So that's what we do with this LPU. We call it the light processing unit on the bottom there, where it will start to move under our under our tank, basically, push the resin out like a toothpaste to the side and make this nice building area. In the next step, we will turn on the laser. And then this picture right here, it will basically go in and out of this picture, basically, and will go back and forth. And then the LPU will basically move very slowly under our part. And you can actually um, see this happening on the printer itself. If you have never watched a Form 3 or Form 3B, you can imagine this uh, looking a little bit like a 2D scanner that you might have if you have like a fax or a copy machine, for example, where you also have this very uh, little like tiny light head which moves very, very quickly. And then the whole beam basically moves under the A4 page or whatever you want to scan. And it's very similar here, basically, where you will go through very, very quickly there. And then when the LPU is basically moved all the way to the side, um, what will have happened is that we've cured the next layer of resin from the bottom, basically, onto our model. But now that we have cured it to the bottom, basically, it also now sticks to the bottom of the resin tank. So that's where we basically have to take it off again. And we basically just bring the whole build platform up until it detaches from the bottom, and then it goes back down again. And then as a little bit of a cycle, it basically goes like this, uh, we drop sorry. in. Sorry, yeah. Jakob, to interrupt again. So everyone sure. who is not seeing Jakob while he's speaking on his screen, on the top right corner, there is a button called speaker view. So you must be in gallery view and then you have to jump into speaker view so you can see uh, uh, Jakob and uh, his background on your full screen. Yes. So, just reiterating this real quick, we take what we have already printed, dip it into the resin until we just leave that space to the bottom of the tank, squeeze the resin that's too much out, cure the next layer of resin from the bottom onto there, and then we have to detach everything from the bottom of the tank and then go back into the resin. And that's basically what we always do. And then when the print is finished, the build platform will be all the way on the top, and then your models will basically hang upside down on the build platform. 
and then you will basically do everything that Bernhard just showed you a minute ago. And I think next up is Eliza, um, who wants to show you a little bit more on how to be even more productive with a printer and keep it running but almost 24 seven, uh, depending on how well you can go along with the digital workflow there. And I think you're still muted, Eliza. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, I, let me share my screen. Okay, are you able to see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, okay, so thank you, Jacob, for showing this. I think that we all, again, learn some new things and when, every time we listen to you. So thanks for that. So one important point about uh, once you're printing, we say, okay, let the, your Form 3B print while your workers sleep. This is, uh, I would just re um, repeat some very important aspects that Jacob mentioned, that while you work, again, you need to consider while your workers sleep, uh, how you want to manage your practice structure in order to optimize your clinical time overall. So if you need to print models for that day or you have a patient that has an emergency and they lost their retainer or broke their aligner, then you can use a vertical, uh, let's say horizontal printing directly on the build platform. And maybe you can print a model with draft, for example, for a very fast model production in approximately 20 minutes. And uh, but if you also, for example, finish your practice for the day and then you don't, it doesn't matter if you need a model for that exact same day, then you can organize your practice, uh, plan to have your models printed vertically so you can combine more, um, uh, more models in one print job and let it print overnight. So it's a matter of understanding how you want to structure your practice overall and, and, and you can choose between uh, this uh, printing parameters in order to optimize your time. So one another important thing in order that it's a very useful tool is Dashboard. Dashboard is an online job management tool that actually allows you to see what you're printing in which printer with which resin and how much time is it, uh, does it take to for that print job. So actually this is a very useful tool on the overall practice management because you can keep track of, of your printers if you have more than one. So you can see all the combination of, of your different printers and you can decide, okay, uh, how much time you would take an estimate and then you plan your practice according to this and your patient visits. And also uh, it's very important to bear in mind, you also uh, need to get your staff on board. So you also need to know how you will arrange your overall um, printing time and practice management in order to see how you will delegate the stacks, who will do what, and if your dental assistant is going to do some washing or curing, so you know exactly what are you doing uh, and in, in which and at what time. So this is a, a very useful tool for that purpose, and you can view this from anywhere, from your computer or smartphone. So actually, this is another advantage. We know that we dentists uh, are working in a physical place where we see patients, but this digital tools gives us an, a more flexibility and allows us to um, be not tied to a physical place overall. So this is a, actually a very useful tool together with the next one, which is remote printing. So again, um, sometimes when we don't have a model or sometimes we need the resources that are in our practice, but actually if you have the software and you finished, for example, the practice for the day, then you can take your computer home you can do, uh, do the setup in, in Clear Aligner Studio in your computer. And then, for example, you set up the printer as Jacob just showed. You let it let all set up with a resin tank, build platform, on cartridge. And when you're ready to print, you just upload the print, the print job from your home without being physically present in your practice. So actually, again, this is a very useful tool because it means that we are not 100% uh, dependent on the physical place in order to keep on producing uh, the, the models for aligner production. So uh, I think that the flexibility of the workflow is an advantage for us in dentistry. And this is a huge difference from the conventional workflows. And it's something that uh, it's very valuable for us overall. So um, what the only thing that you need to do is to set up the printer with uh, all of the aspects that I just mentioned, and you need to prime your printer, the Form 3B. This is a feature of the Form 3B. I needed to mention that, not of the Form 2. But you need to prime your printer, and you can do that from the control of your, on the screen of your printer. 
So you prime your printer, it's very straightforward, and you also need to uh, log in into dashboard and see that you have your printer uploaded. So this is a very useful tool also. And I want to share another testimonial. We have a lot of questions about uh, speed or, or how to optimize uh, speed. And, and, and again, I want to get back to the point that you need to, uh, adopting the digital workflow requires a practice restructure. So you need to structure your practice accordingly. You can you have a lot of resources in order to combine horizontal printing, vertical printing, materials, layer height settings. So it's a matter of arranging your practice accordingly. I want to share again this testimonial by Dr. Burton. He also shared the testimonial regarding uh, how he solved the retainer case uh, during uh, the COVID crisis. And actually he, sh he shared this testimonial which I think is very powerful saying that you don't want your dental assistant to be always out of your practice, meaning uh, helping you, assisting you, treating a patient, uh, and being only dedicated to washing and, and curing and thermoforming. Uh, you need to structure your practice accordingly. You need to know how you want your staff to distribute their own time. So you need to also plan that ahead. Maybe sometimes having speed in, in, is a balance also of doing a practice arrangement overall. So also, you know, knowing who will be managing this. Us professionals delegating this to the dental staff, we need to prepare that accordingly. So it's a matter of restructuring overall your practice. And I think that once you target that, it's very easy because everything runs so smoothly and you reduce a lot of the times uh, that are needed for the overall workflow. But I will touch base also again for the overall of the advantages of adopting all this workflow and challenges in a couple of the following slides. So getting back to Bernard regarding post-processing, this is, I leave it up to you, Bernie. Sorry, again, I was muted. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, very okay. Fine. Okay, thank you very much again, Elisa. Um, so now we have our printed parts and we need now to post-process them. Um, and actually washing and post-curing is a standard step in all SNA uh, 3D printing um, technology. And it is also a crucial part uh, for the quality of the printed models. Printed objects are never fully cured when they come out of the printer, which means you need to post-process them to reach the desired mechanical properties. And if you had a form two, this workflow might already be familiar to you. Um, so the first step would be, um, you will have to bring the build plate uh, to the form wash. The form wash is the device we have um, to remove the remaining uncured resin from the object. We use IPA to dissolve these resins and the form wash automates this process a lot because you don't have to worry anymore about forgetting the parts in the IPA. You just set up your washing time for gray and dental model it will be like 10 minutes. After the wash cycle, cycle, uh, cycle the part will uh, be automatically lift up uh, to prevent the part from dissolving in IPA. You can place the whole build plate uh, in the tray of the form wash. If needed, uh, you could alternatively remove the parts from the build plate and place them in the basket for it uh, to clean. To remove the parts from the build plate, uh, we re recommend to use our tools, which may not be always as easy as you want to, because in the case of models that you have printed flat on the build plate without any supports, um, you will need something more uh, special. Um, we're using in the office, we're using sharpened spatulas or I'm using now a razor blade scraper that I found at Amazon for this. And this helps a lot because otherwise like with the tools you get uh, with your printers, it would be impossible to get another model. Um, as I said, the form wash will automatically reopen when it is finished. After washing, if not done already, you have to remove the parts from the build plate in order to put them in the form cure where you have to final cure them. The recommended settings for dental model uh, and gray are th uh, 30 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius. 
here. And one important thing to keep in mind is um, you need to dry washed parts completely before curing them because otherwise you will have trapped IPA in the object and this will decrease the medical, mechanical properties of the object. You may want to use your existing dental uh, light curing device to do this step, but uh, KV Ed, uh, most of these devices uh, are operating on a different wavelength. For our resins, uh, you need uh, a wavelength of 405 nanometers. And the, most of the dental devices are using 450 nanometers, to my knowledge, at least. Um, and also the light intensity um, of these dental curing devices can uh, be different from the form cure. And we cannot give any recommendations about exposure times uh, due to the variety of devices on the market. To have a seamless and safe workflow, we strongly recommend to use uh, the form cure for this step. So now we have our models, they are cured. And I will just very quickly walk you through the final production steps of the actual aligner. So what do we need? Um, and many of you, if you're a dental technician, you will be very familiar with these steps already because they are actually uh, identical uh, to the traditional workflow. Um, the tools you need are a thermoforming machine, um, the sheets for thermoforming. Normally they're, uh, they're varying um, between 0.5 millimeters and uh, roughly one millimeter, depending on uh, the type of aligner you want to produce. And uh, the final thick, the thickness, uh, by the way, is reduced by the thermoforming process. And from my side, um, I'm not a big fan of cutting um, thermoformed disc with a cutting disc. Um, I like to use scissors because they're not heating up the material. And uh, the downside of this being that you have to do so uh, to remove the re retainer from the model first uh, in order to get uh, with your scissors to the edge. So, and then uh, we're starting with a the thermoforming process. This may be familiar to many of you. Um, you can use any dental thermoforming machine. Um, and you will have to use the recommended settings uh, from the manufacturer of the machine and the sheets. Um, some of these machines are operating on pressure. Some are operating on vacuum. And they basically heat up the sheet and then uh, it is pressured or sucked down on the model. And um, you will have to do so to fix the sheet in a special jig that uh, then you will um, swipe in and put the heat source above it. Once heated up, um, you remove the heater and the sheet then is pressed or sucked down onto the model. In this step, it gets stretched. Uh, that's why the final thickness of the liner is less than the sheet was originally. And uh, you now have to remove the model with a plastic sheet from the machine to finish it. Um, if you have undercuts in the model, uh, it will be a little more difficult to remove uh, the actual aligner from the model. Um, but this is not a big issue because aligner sheets are very thin and very flexible most of the time. Some machines use also steel granulate uh, to embed the model, and this granulate is also tending to stick on the thermoformed sheet. Uh, you, you will also need to remove it. So the next step will be first uh, you remove the excess material of the sheet you don't need. And you can use indeed a diamond cutting disc for this. And then in the second step, you will try to cut out uh, the aligner um, to its final dimensions uh, as, as good as you can. And this can in fact be done uh, while the aligner is still on the model. In this case, you will damage the model, but uh, anyways, you don't need it anymore. And here again, I would use uh, the scissors instead of the cutting disc uh, because the cutting disc, as I said, is heating up the material. And as it is a thermoplast, you just, uh, can, be, uh, can get uh, uh, stuck uh, into, the, into the thermo sheet, or uh, you can even deform parts of the aligner. So then the final contour is usually um, shaped using a carbide cutter. Uh, they allow you to go into the interproximal areas a lot, 
and give the edge of the aligner a nice and smooth curve. For polishing, we recommend using special polishing wheels for thermoforming sheets because polishing is producing uh, very much heat and with traditional silicon polishers, you will just melt it. Um, you can also do polishing um, with pumice and water in the really traditional way. Uh, in this uh, case, you even have the cooling effect of the water on the sheet. Uh, there are two um, methods to do the polishing. One is doing it in a hand piece, uh, or the second one is going directly to the polishing motor. This is up to you uh, and up to how, to how you learn to do this. So then you have to polish uh, the edges and you're done. Then there it is, your final product, the thermoformed aligner and finished aligner ready to be delivered to the patient. Uh, the shaping of the aligner, as I said, only takes uh, about 10 to 50 minutes for a trained technician. And actually it was really fun to do. I, I at least love it. So that's uh, from my side uh, for the aligner production. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now handing over again to Elisa, I think. I'm mute. Okay, so can you see my screen? That's okay. Yeah, awesome. So uh, thank you, Bernie, for, for wrapping up, let's say the post-processing and clear aligner production. So I think it's important for uh, now to summarize a little bit all the workflow that we have seen right now. So we have seen integral scanning, uh, planning and designing software, manufacturing and post-processing. So after seeing all of the workflow, we can detect that there are a lot of advantages and challenges. So overall, uh, as a summary, uh, we wanted to combine these uh, concepts and say, okay, for the advantages, we noticed that the overall patient experience and uh, clinical outcomes can be better in the sense that, for example, intraoral scanning, we know that it is uh, for patients, it in, really enhances experience and changes completely the experience overall. I think that Dr. Jan can, and, and Zune can, of course, say um, more about this, well, especially for pa patients that have a gag reflex that it's uh, very acute in the sense, right? That is correct. And uh, we see this a lot uh, if we ask patients. And of course, a lot of studies show this as well. So patient has been asked, uh, what do you prefer, uh, the normal impressions or let's say the intraoral scanner? And there is no one that is choosing the impression after trying the intraoral scanner. So for, for end users, this is a no-brainer. So it's very, very professional. Absolutely. I'm, and as dentists, we can say that, of course, the, taking the impression of has its technique, but overall for the patient, uh, even when there are small patients, we know that this can condition on what's going to be their approach to dentistry in the future. Just a bad experience. So actually, we are affecting the overall approach of patients to future of dentistry and uh, with just taking an impression. So I think that here in troll scanning is a huge advantage for, for patient engagement and approach to our profession overall. So uh, looking a little bit about this next steps of the workflow, we see that this is easy to adopt. We see that the intro scanner is uh, very compact, very easy to use. The, the, the clear liner studio is, it's, it has a learning curve, but it is feasible. It is, uh, you can use it. A lot of people we saw in the chat that they're using this already. The printer is very easy to set up. It is easy to delegate um, this to, to our dental assistants if needed. So it is uh, very straightforward and it's very easy to adopt it overall. You won't have to face any internal barriers with your staff. It's just a matter of training. Also, it's improved efficiency uh, and, and time in, in, the, in the sense that it's time and cost savings. We are reducing a lot of intermediate steps overall, which not only are adding more steps, can add more errors in between, but also we are reducing time potentially that we have our patient in during our practice. So overall, it saves a lot of time and uh, amounts of visits and cost savings because we reduce a lot of intermediate steps. Also, for this applies for internal scanning overall, there is no deformation risk of impressions. We know that sometimes we take an impression and if it's antenate, we have a specific time that we need to uh, pour the plaster to prepare the plaster model. This is not the case anymore. It, is, uh, it reduces that step and actually uh, uh, potential alterations of that, uh, of that model. So we achieve a physical model that it's going to be static in the measurement if we did everything correct in the internal scanning part, of course. 
So that is something that very important to bear in mind. And of course, the data storage, uh, it's very important. It's not that we're tied to having one model. Now we have this data backed up, backed up. And if the patient needs it, no matter where they are, we can share the file with them. And also worldwide reachability. Maybe you're working with a lab that is using Clear Aligner Studio in another location that it's not, um, let's say, on your same country, maybe. So this can happen. And I think that that allows worldwide access to the information and a lot of uh, possibilities of working with, a, with specific labs if we're already doing that. And also a high return of investment. So this is more for the user testimonials that uh, use our, our, our printers and, and the digital workflow. They are adopted this in their practice. So once you get the, um, all the workflow on board and you structure your practice correctly, it is very uh, easy to, say, to see an impact overall and have a high return on investment. So of course, this brings like, in order to all the advantages and take the best out of the workflow, there are some challenges. There is a learning curve in the sense that yes, we learn dentistry uh, the conventional way, analog workflows, and it's like learning something new overall. So we need to be uh, safe that we have the principles of, for example, what is a correct impression or what is needed in for a specific clinical case or what are the orthodontic movements that we can do or to what extent. We need to always have the clinical concepts, but there are some new skills that we need to acquire and that can take a learning curve, but it's not that much. So if you're, you will see a great impact and I think it's worth going through this uh, learning curve. So uh, again, practice structure and management, time and space. You, as we're adopting the digital workflow, we, for example, for printing, it would be best to have a dedicated sector in the practice or in the lab in order to do this. And um, so you need to plan this ahead. What, uh, what space you will need for the printer and everything, although it's a desktop size, it will be good to have this combined together with the post-processing area. So these are things that you need to also think about when you're planning to adopt the workflow. So skills and training for yourself and your staff, following the good principles of intro or scanning, the software skills and printing, and best practices using preform model orientation in order to have good print jobs. Understanding the overall digital workflow, it's uh, not only for us, but for our dental team, and also get the dental team on board. And of course it has an initial cost, but again, it is a very good, um, it's a good, it's a digital dentistry is here to stay. And I think that for the clinical outcomes and patient experience and overall practice management and flexibility of the workflow for the professional, actually, I think it's a, it's a very useful tool. I don't know, Dr. Jenny, if you want to add any other statement to this, um, let's say roundup conclusion, or if that's okay. <laughs> so uh, for the following slides, this is just an example. So for example, for 3D printing specifically, it is very important to bear in mind this space that I was talking about. And so it's very good for practice management and space uh, organization to have a dedicated space for your cat, uh, for your design station, the, the, as you see here, the printer, the wash, the cure, a post, a extensive post-processing area where we can remove the parts with all our accessories and cartridges and resin tanks, very easy to change with a printer. And so you need to consider a little bit about these things, but we also have dentists that are now using their printer at home, just testing out. So it's desktop size, but for practice overall, it's good to have a dedicated space. So yeah, that's uh, it for me and getting back to you, Giorgio. Uh, yeah, thanks, Elisa. Thanks everyone uh, for joining. Um, before we start wrapping up, uh, I want to launch this uh, poll. Uh, we want to see uh, like how your perspective on producing clear aligners in your practice or lab have changed. Uh, so I want to see how the how building up this knowledge change your impression on the main concern and challenges to adopt that in your clinic. So if you take a moment um, to fill out that poll. And um, yeah, in general, this was a very interesting experience. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested to get, uh, I think we're all very interested in getting your feedback. Um, the easiest way to provide your feedback is uh, we're not totally done yet, but when you leave uh, the Zoom meeting, you'll, uh, there, is, there will be a survey that will pop up. It would be great if you take less than a minute to, to, to fill it out. Um, um, I think we could stay for another five minutes of some Q&A, interesting Q&A. Uh, but before we, we move to that, I would like to leave a small message um, 
to you and everyone. We're a bit in a very interesting and, and tough situation at the moment. Uh, but uh, I think and we all think that the second half of 2020 will be very interesting and very strong. Uh, I think all of these cases out there will not go anywhere. They'll just come back to your clinics and to your lab to be done. And you should uh, get ready to be build up your skills and, and be enough productive to meet that peak in demand when everything goes back to normal. So stay strong, uh, stay, stay healthy. And, and the second part of this year will be very promising and very interesting for all of us. And if you want to build up your skills when you're already uh, at home, uh, our, our drop shipment of printers from the direct sales team is still on. You can order your printer, very affordable. You can start practicing at home. You can contact, contact more, the more than 200 or 300 partners that we have worldwide to purchase your printer. They're, they're drop shipping. It can get to your home. You can practice in there. And then once the clinics open up and everything goes back to normal, you're ready to hit the road. Yeah, I guess that's uh, from my side. Thank you for filling uh, the poll. Dr. Jan, if you want to add anything before we take some Q&A and, uh, Q and about the last part. Yes, we have shared a lot of links uh, during this afternoon uh, in the chat menu and uh, the questions. So, uh, of course, we would like to share those links also afterwards in the, let's say, post-webinar mail that we will send out to everyone. Uh, in there, there will also be uh, shortcuts, uh, how to reach more training material, uh, the downloadables that we saw here in the presentation as well, uh, and also more information how to uh, go to uh, uh, virtual classrooms, webinars, and so on to learn more uh, about both the scanning, the clear aligner and other softwares, and of course, uh, all the Formlabs products as well. So you will get everything there. Uh, and afterwards, you will also receive a recording of this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, you can use that link uh, to share also with uh, others, uh, because then they will have to register again, and they will get their own, uh, let's say, viewing link uh, as well. Of this. Yeah, and just so to yeah. reiterate on that, uh, the email will not be sent immediately. We're going to customize that through uh, Formlabs, and hopefully you'll receive that email by end of today, but from Formlabs directly in that case, or if you have registered through a promotion of one of our partners, uh, our partners uh, will uh, reach out to you with the, with the follow-up and the, the registration. And in that follow-up email, if you've attended uh, this session, uh, you will receive our, our nice like uh, certificate of attendance for that first ever possible virtual seminar on clear aligners for three hours. Uh, it was very impressive. The retention rate, everybody, like most of the people that joined are still online. So thank you very, very, very much for, um, for, uh, for joining. We really appreciate that. Uh, stay strong and healthy. Uh, Jacob, uh, Bernie, Elisa, Sune, Dr. Jan, really thank you very much. And uh, we're going to stay online for, um, for some, uh, some questions regarding the last part for the next I think three or four minutes. So are there any typical questions that we, we were getting? Yes. Yeah. I see a lot of questions about hollowing um, models. So from my side, I can uh, tell that this is uh, the best to do in the, uh, in the cut step when you actually produce um, the model in, in the model builder. But I'm not really sure if this is possible with three shape. Um, this is my question to Suna, for example, and about um, hollowing um, models with external tools. This would be a topic for Jakob, I think. Um, yes, when it comes to hollowing, um, there's no doubt that, of course, it would be best that, that you hollow the model prior to uh, the actual tooth movement so that all of the sub setups that you make is made on a, on a hollow model. Uh, that would be... Uh, Probably preferable, um, but yes, uh, Jacob, you can answer on on. Yeah. on Sure, I would be happy to. Uh, and if we have the minute, um, may maybe you can scroll through the other questions. Um, in the meantime, uh, I can actually show you the basically three-step process that it would be. Um, this is the software which we have already uh, talked about. It's called Mesh Mixer. You can just get this on meshmixer.com. It's for free. And you would just import your model. I've just 
been using this spun here, which is just a quick model. And then what you would be doing is just to show how easy it actually is, is you would click on edit on the left side. And then there's a function here called hollow. So you would click on there and then it will just quickly go through this. And then basically the main thing that you would set is the offset distance, which is the wall thickness of your model. I will just leave this at two millimeters. And then you can just double click on your model anywhere to set one of these suction holes. And you can, if you click on this red uh, button there and you can just drag and drop it around. So to basically hide the suction hole. And if you click accept, the whole model will be hollowed out and you will have your suction hole in there. You have, as you might have seen on the side, you have a lot more options there to set, like the dimensions of this hole and stuff like that. But other than that, you would just click File, Export, and then you would just export it as a hollowed out model. And this is how quickly you can get to a hollowed out part. I see there are also some questions on uh, why are we uh, printing models? Uh, why don't we just print the aligners? Um, and and that would of course be a huge beneficial thing because then you can skip a lot of steps and um, that will be the way forward. Um, the material that is used has to be uh, very uh, rigid but still flexible in order to uh, facilitate the, the forces that are moving the teeth in the right uh, way. So that is one thing. The other thing is that it needs to be a biocompatible material. Uh, so that's another thing that uh, the, the chemistry uh, needs to be the correct one for, uh, for 3D printing uh, because you need to have it in, in the mouth for, for up to a week. Uh, and you actually need to wear the aligner quite a lot, uh, up to at least 21, uh, 22 hours a day. If you can, you should wear them 24 hours a day. Um, that would be, of course, optimal, but uh, only remove them when you need to clean, clean the teeth or eat and drink. Uh, so they are still, uh, I know that, uh, I mean, we hear rumors about, or we hear not only rumors, but we hear that uh, there are printable materials in the market, but it's still being tested and um, it, it needs to have the right forces. Uh, yeah. So there's, there's still a little bit of, you know, a little bit way uh, down the line before we have it ready. Yeah, adding a bit on that point. So for the people who don't know, uh, we recently publicly announced that we acquired our our photopolymer manufacturer, our resin manufacturer, Spectra, based in Ohio, and and uh, so we basically now manufacture uh, all of our resins internally, and sometimes we partner with third-party resin manufacturers. But point is, we have an ISO certified facility to develop uh, and manufacture biocompatible materials, and we're investing a lot and in expanding our portfolio of resin. So stay tuned for a lot of interesting things coming up next directly from Formlabs or from some partnership with third party resin manufacturers. Um, and adding specifically on uh, printing directly clear aligners. Today, it's a big challenge to actually 3D print the aligners directly and have the same mechanical properties and characteristics of a thermoformed aligner. So uh, there's definitely a race in that direction, but it will take uh, a couple of years before we, we get a proper material and then uh, a bit more to get the right clinical studies around that. So, I would just like to answer one or two additional questions that I see popping up uh, in the Q&A uh, quite a lot. Um, so yes, there is a recording of this. This will be available a little bit later. We will send this out via email and you will also get the certificates of attendance through that email. Um, I'm not sure, maybe Giorgio can tell us real quick if this is going to be two emails. I think so. Um, the recording should just come as a standard email just from Zoom itself. And mm -hmm. then you can download it there and rewatch it. And then we'll also send out the certificates. Yeah. So regarding that point, uh, no, actually for, for the attendees of this webinar, uh, we're aiming tomorrow to have the follow-up email that includes both the certificate and uh, the recording of the, the email. Okay. I, good. I think should we, we can. Uh, should we go to uh, to the happy hour? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna bring my beer. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Jojo, bring me. Ready? <laughs> no, Jojo, yeah. I, I don't have any beer. Bring me one. <laughs> uh, Bernie, maybe you can bring one to yourself with a special background. 
Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, where is it? Oh, I don't find it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Can we change the slide to the next one? Uh, yeah. Georgia, thank you. That's your yeah, account. okay. I, I will actually share. This is a special <laughs> slide that uh, Dr. Jan added. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here we go. So I guess if you want to enjoy some time. Uh, yeah. And this is the, like this is the bar in Berlin, right? Yeah, what this is a bar name? in Berlin. Uh, I think it was Magen uh, Recker or something like that. Mong uh, Yes, so, yes. This is a live uh, picture then. So this is uh, this is a still picture, but it's it's uh, from a live bar, uh, real one. Yeah, I can recognize uh, the beer yeah. brands. <laughs> so oh. it's uh, Urquell and uh, Jefe and so on. So it's uh, typical. Yeah. Like I can see that Berlin beer. Yeah. Nice. Thanks for making the effort and adding yeah. that to the slides. The special touch <laughs> in this sense. And yeah. this is because we were supposed to be in Berlin, every everyone, yeah. uh, meeting everyone there. Uh, but this way, we had the possibility to reach out to so many more, and to make this, uh, let's say, the first ever uh, virtual seminar. Uh, and a joint seminar for all of us as well. So I would like to say thank you to uh, you guys at Formlabs. And uh, let's make a rerun of this, I propose. Yeah, I, I think uh, the audience can expect something very soon. Uh, we're trying to make our, our best to make the most out of the situation. And, and we really appreciate the support of uh, our attendees and participants in, in that. Absolutely. And... I think that this is a great opportunity to all of us. I think that I can speak for a lot of the dental community. Some of you already adopted the workflow, some of you are starting. Uh, we know that the industry as a healthcare profession, it's constantly updating and training ourselves. So this kind of seminars, I think it's very useful for us to have a, vi a clear vision of what a, this digital revolution is taking us to, so. Yeah, and, and I also liked, uh, it, it was really, um like interactive with um, a lot of speakers. And I think um, most of the switches between speakers were quite good, right? Yeah, yes. we'll, we'll see in the survey, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for everyone that joined. And I yeah. hope that everyone has their own uh, beer or glass of wine at home in order to finish the yeah, yeah, definitely. after the seminar. Well deserved rest, Brandon. So. We did an extra uh, 30 minutes. Thank you for staying there. And uh, stay strong and safe, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Stay, stay strong and safe, yeah. And thank you for, uh, for all your patience. Uh, it's, it's been uh, many hours, but uh, it's nice to see that people are still uh, staying on. So. So thank you for your time and interest. Hey, uh, ciao, ciao, everyone. Thank you very much. And have a great afternoon or morning, depending where you are. So thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Stay ciao. safe. See you next time. See you.